Hi, I'm Edwin. And I am Jack, and welcome back to the 950 Club. Hey, hey. Hi, I'd like to make a quick note about viewer discretion. Today we'll be talking about two anime that contain uh, both nudity, foul language, and uh, loads of violence. Yeah, more than a typical anime, at least with modern day anime, I would argue. Yeah. So, uh, parents, be warned. Thank you. Both have cult status, though, and both have a strong regard with their fan base. And, yeah, you'd be surprised that they're still talked about today. And, and yeah, we couldn't help but do the kill special. Yes, the... The double kill. The double with, kill. Uh, <laughs> kill a kill and Akame got killed. Oh, yes. And both are came out around the same time, too, almost 10 years ago. I found it unusual that they came out, that they only came out 10 years ago because they feel the, the feel of these two shows yeah. feels a lot older. Yeah. And something about it when I first seen them, I was like, wow, this is like peak anime art wise, music wise. It's still resonant. Don't get me wrong. But something about the last five years, of course, with inclusions of Demon Slayer and Jujutsu Kaisen. Wow. Like, yeah, there's a, there's a big gap right there, unfortunately. Well, I think you've seen a shift where you have more specifics like in Jujutsu Kaisen. There's definitely a, I don't want to say generic, but there's a, a more specific feel to what they're doing. Yeah. Where with Akame Ga Kill, uh, it felt like, well, these two shows feel like anime to me. Oh, yeah. I don't know how I would define that, where other shows might feel like just shows, like Jujutsu Kaisen you mentioned, or uh, Mushiko Tensei, Jobless Reincarnation which is like the height of the isekai genre right now. Spectrum, yeah. Yeah. Um, but with these two, they feel like like anime. Yeah. You and know? both are callbacks too, I would argue. I, I think so. And I think that's why, it, for me, it's like ringing that little psychological bell yeah. for me because it feels, especially with like Kill a Kill, the artwork style feels like it's from a much older time. And Ryuku, um, the main character for that one, uh, she feels like not a satire of an old shonen uh, protagonist, but kind of, sort of. Yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. like Luffy, kind of like uh, Goku, mm -hmm. and yeah, just her own take on it. Yeah, and a real it, throwback to like almost like to like a nineteen seventies character. Yeah, in yeah. a specific term, uh, Grindhouse, like super like. Bad, oh yeah super badass and that comes through yeah. in, especially in kill a kill yeah akame got killed too because it, akame herself the main character she basically is like a throwback to lady snowblood the infamous uh 1970s Jap uh, japanese film i can see that that inspired uh kill bill another kill yeah <laughs> so overall you know both both these share a lot of slim similarities not just with the context of the time but also like in between plot lines and like story structure we have we oh, yeah, there's definitely, like, you know, both of them are essentially about our protagonists uh, essentially overthrowing uh, a repressive, restrictive system, which, I mean, a lot of shonen work that way. But I think the, with these two specifically, they take it to an extreme that you don't see. A ridiculous amount. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially in Kill a Kill. Yeah. And they both have, like, plot th like little plot instances. Like, there's a scissor involved. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of similarities. I don't know if one informed the other. Yeah. Especially with the scissors. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. Oh yeah. But there's a moment where two of the characters who uh Esdeth and Satsuki, who are uh very similar in their positions, 
and they both refer to you know uh subjugation or death yeah yeah and i was like wow yeah that sounds like you know that's i get that from these two yeah. characters and, and both are definitely one of those type of villains you either like or you hate and they have that very thin line oh i remember the first time i watched akaman got kill as death i i just i'm like why can't they take this bitch out? I'm so sick. <laughs> I am so sick of this lady. I, I was but, like, but if that, I, yeah. that she's the final battle did not surprise me at all because I'm like, that lady was on a totally different level from everybody else. Yeah. And yeah, it basically, that's an effective job of a villain in a weird way. And with... Uh, oh, yeah. she It works completely because she makes you hate her. Oh, yeah. Very there much so. There is no... I mean, you can feel sorry for Esdeath uh, or, or you can like say, oh, she loves, uh, you know, Tatsumi. he loves Tatsumi. Yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> she, that woman is evil to the core. <laughs> Fuck her, man. Mm -mm. And yes, yeah, like we, Edwin warned, parental advisory from here on out. Well, I think that I think that both of these shows inspire some strong feelings, especially toward the antagonists. Yes. Uh, there's a lot going on. These fights become emotionally charged in ways more so than some of the other shows that we've talked about. Especially in Akama Got Kill, I think that the stakes are the stakes are literally life and death. Yeah, and, and political. Yeah. Well, we get we'll get to that when we talk about the show, but just for the the sake of the special, I think that these shows have really they're really emotional charged. I think in ways that and they're modern, and they're more adult. I think than something like uh, Demon Slayer. Or uh, Jujutsu Kaisen, yeah. and literally yeah. the throwback aspect of it, like anime like this, could have easily been in the eight, uh, '90s or even uh, 2000s. Yeah, and I think that's for me that was one of the problems with Akamaga Kill, yeah. uh, where it's it, it kind of doesn't do enough, I think, to differentiate itself from I, some of the others. So. I would agree. I would agree. Yeah, and then we'll we'll get into that. I, I think it works really well for Kill a Kill. I mean, that retro styling that it has. I think it really works there really well, but it also manages to separate itself. And in, in certain ways, it's a lot like Kaguya-sama, Love is War, where it takes this high school slice of life and totally turns it on its head and blows it up into like, just taking it to the absolute extreme parody edition yeah, of that. Yeah, I was about to yeah. say, parodying itself in a weird way. I, I can see that. Yeah. yeah, there are moments where it's like, we're absolutely so ridiculous, but do you think we've gotten as ridiculous as we can? <laughs> no, nope. we're going to top even that. And that's the ethos, and that's the beauty of Studio Trigger. Because Kill the Kill is the first ever full-on Studio Trigger production. Yeah. They go big or go home, and these guys forgot where they live. No, no. Yep. And like we mentioned in our first uh, instance with Studio Trigger was Brand New Animal. And Brand New Animal is a later stretch, almost 10 years later, uh, or actually, if I do the math right, about seven or eight years after Kill a Kill, during that trajectory, Trigger just got bigger and bigger and better and better. Yeah. Quality wise and story wise too, I would argue too. Ultimately, uh, Kill a Kill was that ethos of transition between Studio Gainax, where most of the creators of Kill a Kill were formed, and to their own offshoot. And Gainax, of course, is infamous for Neon Genesis, Panty and Garter Belt, uh, Gurren Lagan, which is pretty much like. The number, like people consider that the first ever Studio Trigger production. Yeah. Because the same director, same crew, essentially. Be for same B. director, same writer, yeah. Yeah. But Kill a Kill was the official number one. Like, we're doing this zaniest thing from here on out. <laughs> they, Jack, uh, <laughs> Jack loves to do this to me. <laughs> he gets me to watch anime that are, are totally insane. And I'm just left there shaking my head. <laughs> and, you know, invariably, I end up loving them. Uh, because I knew Edwin would like them. We're talking about c keep your hands off Isokan. But the other way around, too, Edwin's got to be more into Isakai, more of other shows I would like to dismiss. Slice Viv of Life. Slice romance, of Life. Yeah. Vivi. Vivi is a great example of that, too. He mm -hmm. kept on Sci-fi. Yeah. yeah. But with, with this particular one, it definitely touches the buttons with that one. You know, I have my favorite categories, my favorite genres. Um, Shonen, I'm not as into as I think that, uh, maybe you are. Yeah. Uh, but I loved Jujutsu Kaisen. I'm not really like Bleach or Naruto or Dragon Ball fan because I feel that a lot of those shows, I felt that they were kind of like too similar to each other. Yeah. And I know I'm going to catch some heat because I know those, 
Those shows have huge fan bases. Including our main producers and backing influences. Yep, Mark, I know. Jamal and Martin. <laughs> Jamal and Martin are going to give me heat over that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I get the appeal. It's just I wasn't into that. But like I said, I really liked Jujutsu Kaisen. So that kind of was like, all right, cool. And so uh, I feel with Kill a Kill, Kill a Kill is kind of like the insane version of a shonen oh, magic. Yeah. So it's like, let's take like Naratu. And let's take Sailor Moon and shove those two together and then just make it balls to the walls crazy. And that's when you get kill a kill. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hypersexualized, hyper, hyper violence. Well, it takes like they've already taken like the, the Japanese schoolgirl outfit and made it into this thing where it's like you can have like numerous discussions about whether it's fetishized, or whether there's a Lolita complex about it. You know, you could have all these discussions about it. I'm not going to have those discussions right now. <laughs> but what I will say is that uh, Kill a Kill takes that to an entirely different level yeah. and throws it into your face and says, accept this or don't, but this is what we're doing. And, and it's crazy. It's crazy. And I love it so. And yeah, full confession, it is it is my favorite Studio Trigger production and it's one of my all-time favorites. And like I mentioned, or if you keep on with our show, Kill a Kill is one of the first ones ever where I just didn't expect to be like over enthralled with this style or anything. I see this as I, I kind of like understood why you like this, where because getting to know you more and more, Jack, and your taste more and more. I felt that this works for you because it kind of reminds me of a fighter video game, yes, like yes. Street Fighter. Oh yeah. Or um, and I'm a big, big sucker for fighting games. Or Mortal Kombat, or like the other ones that are out there. Street Fighter, especially. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like for me, I'm like, okay, I, I get why Jack likes this. <laughs> this is this feels like it feels more like a video game than it does an anime. Yeah. And um, because if you w when you guys start watching this you're going to realize the story and the plot elements are secondary to the fights. Well, they kind of like find their way. And it's one of those things where once you watch that first episode, there'll be a switch on your brain being like, well, oh. I think the more important things are not the story and the, the, you know, the plot elements or, you know, how it develops over the course of the show. The real important thing here is, are the battles. Yes. Yes. And how ridiculous they get. And, and there's the, no shame in that. <laughs> there's no shame in that. At you know, it's like it, it's like most shonen. It's like you start out with a fight that you're like, all right, this is a fight. You you already think that this is ridiculous, but no, 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 no. <laughs> it gets more ridiculous as the show goes on, and more and more and more insane, and to the point where you're like. Okay, the planet's gonna blow up. Because you know, why wouldn't it? Where can we go from here, kind of thing? Yeah, pretty much. But I, I think that the real point of this show is a for the battles and b for the relationships. Yeah, and yeah. The and has as they develop, you know, and as they get closer, and as they struggle to overcome the things that they're fighting. And I mean, I think that's the point of most shonen. I think specifically here. It's like that's where you're gonna find your most your most of your enjoyment is either from the battles or watching these characters grow and change over the course yeah. of the show. Dare I say the design because Ryuku is designed perfectly and yeah during her oh, yeah. her ultra form and it's the same thing with her uh, the villain Sasuke. Yeah, it, it's pretty apparent that there is a, there is a side of it where okay it's gonna explore a little bit more than you expect and. You're in for a good time, but also one of those instances where, oh, my God, why am I watching? <laughs> There's a fine line between there. I'm not going to lie. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like I said. It's like they take the schoolgirl outfit and transform it into something else entirely. And I think that fits with one of the themes of the show. Yeah. So when the creator – I read this on Wikipedia. The creator had said that there was a similarity in how you say fascism – and fashion yes yes in japanese and so that interested him and that's part of what he wanted to include in the story and you get that in kill a kill in that essentially i think what they're saying is that clothes are restrictive yeah clothes are confining and clothes are uh, a form of oppression so there's a rebel organization in the show called nudist beach 
and it's their job to try to destroy the this clothing company and um, Revox. Uh, Revox. Revox. Because it sounds a lot like Reebok for some reason. <laughs> I'm not could sure. Could be. Could why. be attention. Could be attention. Could be. And could be. and that's uh, another theme of the show too. Branding. Branding yes, is a definitely. Big one. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's this struggle between freedom and oppression, and it is the way it's explored in the show is through their clothing. Oh yeah. And so the less clothing that you wear, and I mean, there there's a there's a plot about it, but which you you, which you will find out. Like I said, there, you'll find out it's, the, from starting from the first episode. You'll know that that switch is on. Oh, it gets crazier and crazier as yeah, it goes. Yeah. And you're, I mean, you have to have a villain. You have to have somebody to struggle and fight against. A I conflict. Mean, a conflict. Yes. Okay. That conflict that creates the drama for the show. But yeah, it, it, it what it boils down to is that clothing is restrictive. And in this show, it's a form of a, oppression. Yeah. And so the less, clo- the less clothing you're wearing, the A, the more free you are, and B, the more powerful you are. Well, with the science of it as well, as the show explains. Yeah. Because even with the first episode, like I said, you'll be turning on that switch. You, you're in for a zany time. But also, there's like a little bit of hints of what the show is aiming for. Because the first initial dialogue is that it's in a classroom in Hoji Academy. And the teacher, a blue-haired older guy, he's just rambling on. He's talking about World War II. And he talks about uh, Hitler's rise to fascism in Germany in 1933. And of course, when you think of Nazis, most people would think uniform. So, like, uniformly of this country, of this ideology. And Japan, of course, with their history, hey, they were involved in World War II, too. So, that's, like, the first two sentences. Then, here comes the transfer student. <laughs> you get uh, Ryuko Matoi, who oh, yeah. shows up on the scene looking for trouble. She's actually trying to find out who murdered her father. And the, her only clue is a gigantic scissor blade that was left at the scene of the crime. <laughs> and, yep. and she's holding it as a backpack. You know, for going the first day of school. Yeah, I'm just a transfer student. Yeah, I'm just a transfer student <laughs> with this big gigantic weapon on my back. <laughs> and that gives you your first indication that this show is going to be a little bit crazier than yeah. normal. And right off the bat, you know that Ryuka is way different. A, she, her style, she has a red strand on her head from her hair. And how she's standing, how she's looking up, looking up at authority. Like, this is my starting point. I'm yep. ready to take down this whole thing. Yep. And at first you think that Hojin Academy and Satsuki Kiryuin and her student council. And I like the way this show does this because the student council is always supposed to be the pinnacle of a Japanese school. Oh, you, yeah. know, you look at them. And they kind of like rule over everything with an iron fist. I mean, we saw this in Toradora. At Kaguya-sama. That, yeah, yeah, that archetype of like the hard-ass uh, student council president who everybody has to bow down to. And in, of course, because it's kill a kill, <laughs> they take it to that to an, an absolute extreme. Sasuke is pretty much like the dictator she is the leader like we follow oh, yeah. her and she she backs it up let's just put it that way because her student council is considered the lead four yeah and the lead four themselves they wear these specialized uniforms which they show status yeah. hi- hierarchy like we're closest to power compared yep. to our leader yeah yep. but it also confers on them special powers and abilities because of what they're made out of oh yeah and the, the, what Edwin's been alluding to with this overall fight, overall conflict with the show, is that all these clothes that Revix distribute, distributes, or at least with the more powerful ones, are through these little strands called life fibers. Yes, yeah, so the life fibers give these uh, uniforms their special abilities and powers, and they bring out special abilities of human beings. And... Very soon, Ryuku discovers her own uniform. Oh, yes. And it's part of... Uh, fascinating aspect of the show like edwin mentioned she's out to have revenge with her father or for, for the death of her father and her father had a laboratory like t- torn to shreds and when ryuku was about to talk to him because they haven't talked in years uh, she finds him dead and during this uh you know exchange she she also grabs her scissor blade and she's been told to find this special uniform like well, when she returns to the scene of the crime her teacher, who is more than he seems, yep, yep. Uh, pushes a button, dropping her into a gigantic 
essentially pile of clothing. Yeah. Where she is attacked by a sailor uniform. Oh, yes. In a scene that was very cringy. And I'm like, uh, put me on. And so she's essentially being manhandled by a uniform. A talking sailor uniform. A talking sailor uniform <laughs> who's been given life by the life fibers. And this is just a drop in the hat of the ridiculousness that you get from this show. But one of the cool things is that Ryuku and Senkets, which is Senkets is the name of the uniform. Yes, yes. They form a really strong bond well, over the course of the show. To the, yeah, to the, yeah, they bond right off the bat because uh, Senketsu. Uh, Senkets, yeah. Senkets, he's basically uh, the name itself, Fresh Blood. Oh. Yeah, and how he how he's activated with those special powers is through Ryuku's Fresh Blood. Which, I mean, uh, vampire much? Vampire much. Yeah. And also kind of, like I said, being in between clothing and unclothing. They're, they're assimilated together. Yes. Yeah. <sighs> That's pretty much the literal aspect of it. And she, uh, Ryuko actually gives him that name, Senkets, because she wants to personify this uh, being, this entity. Like, and... Yeah, she she's the only one that can hear him talk, kind of thing. Yeah. It's like not not <laughs> in a, in a tone zany as it is. It makes you think. <laughs> it, it it was like I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> and I love the fact that only she can hear him talking. Yep. And no one else can because it same makes her seem really crazy. Yep. Yep. The family that she goes to live with, she makes a best friend on the first day of school. First day, first second. First hour, day of school. I would argue. Yep. Mako Mankanchopu is her um, her best friend. And <sighs> Mankanchoku is absolutely ridiculous. She's... Like, she is insane. She's the tone of the show. There were moments where I... I never hated Mako, but there were moments where I'm like, what the hell is she talking about? Yeah. I mean, it's so insane that... Even the other characters in the show comment on it. There's a moment that comes later on, and he's like, no, you're not going to get through to her right now. <laughs> it's like, forget about it. <laughs> well, yeah, Mako is pretty much the entity of the show where she pretty much informs the audience what is going on, the character's motives. Well, she, she kind of works as uh, Ryuku's pressure valve. Yeah. Whenever Ryuku is about to lose it, uh, Mako is there to remind her of her humanity. Uh, and I think that that is, and that plays out through the entire, the entire show. And it and grows and grows. They become like inseparable. And, yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's kind of like, because Ryoku right off the bat, she's very, 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 very standoffish, very, yeah. very of her own element. Very, 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 very engraved with this mission of finding the killer of her father. Yeah, getting revenge. Yeah, and she's like, she's like Toshiro Mofane. She's like a total badass in an annoying way. I'm not gonna lie, but it's also kind of like also. She's also she's kind of like a force of nature. I yeah, mean, like yeah. Satsuki realizes pretty quickly. It's like I need to contain this. Not only do I need to contain this woman, but I can use her to my advantage because. She is out of control. Yeah. Ryuku is is like for the for the first half of the show, you see Ryuku as the protagonist. Those things start to change over the course of the second half of the show. Yeah. But yeah, for the most part, Ryuku is almost like this this force of vengeance and almost like a, a tidal wave of destruction. Yeah. Yeah. A little tornado. Like, oh yeah. Like any any instance of her getting to it, because she is convinced. She is convinced actually. I, like that's one of the missing aspects, even second time or third time viewing this, mm -hmm. that uh, I don't, I never really got the clear message of how Ryuko knew that Satsuki killed her father, or at least that clue that she did, because it was like one of those scenes where she thought she saw her, but what was it confirmed? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's not like really important. It's not a plot hole. Yeah. Like I'm definitely missing something because that's how fast the show goes. Like no stop. Oh, no. Boosh. Yeah, no. This, this show, yeah. yeah. This show, it doesn't let you, I mean, and it doesn't really need to give you time to process because, I mean, it's pretty standard what's going on yeah you know and so some things i think are ignored there's so much going on that you might have missed but i think for the most part 
you know, it's like she's there for revenge. Yeah. You get that this is the girl that killed her father, or you believe that this is the girl that killed her father. I mean, until later on when someone else shows up with another scissor, well, the other half of the scissors, and you're like, uh oh, yep, yep. plot twist. Yep, yeah. And yeah. Dun, dun, dun. And that's the thing. Like, even subconsciously, you already know who, the, like, the villain, villain, quote unquote, is. Yeah. Satsuki is yeah. painted as the villain for the first half of the season. Oh, right. I and, mean, yeah. And, and she, she, she owns up. I mean, she is uh, determined to do what it is that she's set out to do. And you find out later on that it's because, you know, she's determined to save the world. That and, of course, initially you get her the Hojin Academy, like, conformed. That's yeah. the, the first I thought. So, like, the first battle, essentially, with the show is conformity. Fighting against conformity. Don't put me in this uniform. I'm going to rebel. Well, Ryuku, that's the idea behind her character. It's like... Why are you trying to make everyone conform? Oh yeah, you know you you, you psycho essentially you psycho bitch. <laughs> it's what she <laughs> essentially is what she tells her. It's like and the, yeah. the swearing is apparent. It's there. It's yeah. There. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. They they drop uh they 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 drop the b bomb. She, she calls she calls uh yeah the skanks you name yeah. it. Yep, yep. Oh yeah. They get a little nasty, and that's why I, I put the parental warning in place for this show. But yeah, I mean, this is it's it's nuts, and it's the fights. The as she fights through as, and I mean, as most shonen, you're gonna have fights. There's like battles every episode, literally, literally, yeah. and that's yeah. part of that like the part of the aspect of the show. You're just prepared for it's gonna be there. Yeah, it doesn't derail anything, but you have to have a certain mode of being like, okay, like I'm not gonna watch this just to get something out of it. I mean, you're the way you're going to get out of it is it's fun. It's fun to watch. Uh, these battles get more and more ridiculous, and it's this show is really funny. I don't think we've played that up on, enough as much as you know in our conversation yet. But Kill a Kill is hilarious. Oh yeah. I mean, you you can forget about the world being. I don't want to say that it's not serious uh, or that you can't take it seriously, but you have to know right away that a lot of this stuff is going to be played for laughs. Yeah. It's going to be like, hey, that's an awesome battle scene. Hey, that's cool artwork. Hey, I love the designs on these characters. But you can't go into this saying, well, this is going to be a serious drama. It's like, no, they're going to play the, the exaggeration. A lot of the exaggeration is played for laughs. If you want to talk about fan service, like the third episode, you see... Uh, you see Ryuku's panties like about 20 times. Yeah. And each one of those times is played for laughs. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. The the dog pulls down her skirt. Everybody's everybody <laughs> I think there are like at, at a certain point there are like five students hanging off of her skirt for dear life because they're they have to there's some kind of like maze that they have to go through to get to school on time. Yeah. To weed out oh, the weak. That's one of my. That's probably my favorite episode. Well, I think that's the one that's mostly played for laughs. Yeah. That that yeah. Well, early on too, and that's yeah. a key fact too. Even Ryuku's like intensity, even her like determination is like apparently funny. It's like that's why I, I mentioned earlier that she's very flawed, and like I'm not cr too crazy about her personally. I'm wearing her shirt, ironically enough. <laughs> I think she's a cool character. I, I think she's a cool character. She's tremendous. Don't get me wrong. I think she's a cool character, but I think. At the same time, she is almost in another storyline. I would agree. Uh, it's like she's almost like this creature that has just dropped out of a different show. Yeah. And here she is because she's kind of like the most straightforward character. Has the goal mind similar, similar to yeah. Satsuki. Yeah. Well, Satsuki. Or Satsuki. Has, Kiryuin has a lot more going on. More ambitious goals, yes. Yeah, like, she's on another level, and Ryuku has to catch up. But, I mean, like, Mako's dialogue and uh, Satsuki's plot points, and then you have poor Ryuku in the middle, and she's just kind of like, what? No, yeah. this has nothing to do with me. Yeah, I'm here to get revenge for the murder of my father. What are you guys talking about? And it's true, because she's we're, she's our viewpoint character, so she's like the most normal, and it's like we're entering this world uh, that's totally full of absurd humor. Yeah, and yeah. the structure of it as well. Hojin Academy, you're thinking like, okay, like these are like a normal school. No, this no. School, this school <laughs> is on top of a mountaintop in this area that they live in. Yeah, and also it's set up literally 
like a better ground. Yeah. It's beautiful. <laughs> Oh yeah, that, that <laughs> the, the the circular arena. Oh yeah, that's the you know that's just perfect for battles. You're one like, on one. The, the Let's get it on the quote unquote courtyard, <laughs> which is really just a place to have fights. It's somehow some way robots are involved, and in well, of course, because this explosions. Is <laughs> explosions, Jack. Well, like built-in explosions. No, no, actually. they destroy everything. <laughs> There's this isn't. I, I think if you played a drinking game, <laughs> if you would take a drink every time something exploded, you would be in the hospital after the first six episodes from alcohol poisoning. I know. It is insane, the number of explosions. That school must have been rebuilt like 50 times <laughs> within the just the first half of the season. Laws of physics are not apparent with Studio Trigger. Osaka's gone. Yep, yep. <laughs> If you take, if you were to take this show literally, Osaka has been wiped off the map by yep, this show. Yep, yep. It was like, and then and twice, <laughs> yep, yep. not just once, but twice. <laughs> the first half when she's trying to take over the high schools, the second half when they're battling the covers. Yeah, yeah. Because of with the school aspect of it, not only is it also like top of the mountain top, like our own personal playground per se, quote unquote. It's also influenced with the city too. Well, Satsuki utters a lot of like fascist rhetoric yes, about yes. people and who they are and what they are. They're swine. Yeah, she calls them pigs. And it reminded me a lot of like uh, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Yes, yes, good call. Where, uh, yeah, where people are essentially just, you know, uh, pigs lined up for the slaughter. And Satsuki, there's a moment where uh, Satsuki essentially, so what she does is she gives these uh, Goku uniforms to the head of clubs yeah the head the president whatever whoever if you're if you're heading up a club you get one of these special uh uniforms and they grant you the powers and at a certain point mako gets one yep and uh she lets it go to her head because as the club becomes more and more popular and they rise through the ranks of the school hierarchy uh, her family is uh, elevated as well, yeah. which would happen in a fascist society. Yeah, and that's one of my favorite episodes too because it, it, it's the, one of the few episodes where there's actually a plot element, yeah. like centered around this what the show is you know trying to deal with, and also like an actual storyline and putting pieces together how special these uniforms are and what status is and how conformed you are with the society. And then it becomes like the ultimate of fascism, where essentially Satsuki says, "Hey." Uh, Mako, you can keep all this. You can keep the riches and the lifestyle that I've given to you, to your family, if you kill my, fr if you kill your friend. Yeah, twisted. You know? And so they, the the fight begins. But at a certain point, Mako says no. Yep. She chooses friendship over, you know, the the things that Satsuki believes that offering her will bend her to her will. Yeah. And Mako rejects all of those because you know Ryuku is her friend. And I thought that that was that was one of my favorite moments in the show. Yeah, and yeah, yeah her world just came crashing down as in Makos because her family is quite unique. We have uh, her father, which is a back alley doctor, her annoying little brother, yep. <laughs> and the lovable bubbly wife. And yes. all three characters have like you know living poor per se in Japan, yeah. but also like yeah because her brother as well is kind of like a thief. Well, you do have. I mean, they're because they're not. They haven't been granted uniforms by the system. Yeah, and the system, and it's really it, it's kind of interesting in that the whole city is built around, and it, it and I like the way that it takes like that high school like click yeah. structure. Yes, yes, and that hierarchy where you know the the student council president stands at the top of that social hierarchy, and it takes it to this extreme where the society of the city is based on that hierarchy where like if you're like you know the student council president or a member of the student council then you're granted yeah. more perks and also so your say. and also your abilities as well like yeah. with uh, muda for example one of the elite four he, he basically is the hacker I and mean, he uh, influences a lot with technology and incel and stuff like that and yeah if you're great at something or you're top of the tier with it you're part of my clique you know th these other people down below they're scum yeah and essentially and, yeah. Tr and trigger's not shy with that like a lot of their projects pretty much have that central theme too 
hierarchy and bureaucracy and like structure. It, it, the brand new animal, which was our first review, that was pretty much like what it was, like laws of the land, like your status is, puts you here. Even Darnley and the Franks kind of has that structure too. Yeah. And yeah, Gur and Lagan, their first ever thing, also pretty much parodied to that. Yeah. So that, that's the beautiful thing of the trigger. They don't lose their way. Literally. Well, no, they're they're definitely discussing like society and the the hierarchy in society, and the different social structures and how they play out and how people are treated. Yeah. And you definitely see that here in Kill a Kill. Yeah. Um, if you take a you know a more serious look at it, and how society, um, the metaphors for how society works, and how restrictive society is and how it has its social structure it's classes yeah. where you know you have your leader class and your working class and then your your you know your lower class and you definitely see that here and the way it plays out yeah and this is us like thinning it out pretty much trying to convince you to watch this because well there's meat here yeah, i mean yeah. it's it's japanese animation yes and as we spent and... as we spent a lot of time on this show trying to illustrate the fact that when you go into this, it's not just going to be, you know, these are these are not kids' shows. Not just battle, 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 fight, yeah. fight, fight. Well, I mean, it, there's that. I mean, you know. It's pretty um, much like it, what it is. Kill a Kill is a parody of Shonen. Yes, yes. So you're going to have your fighting, you know, you're going to have your fight scenes. But there's definitely that discussion, you know, it might be supercilious in this one. You know, playing it to the extremes, but it's still there. That discussion is still there. There's Very still a discussion so. about society and society, you know, the societal structure and how this works and, you know, discussions about fascism, but that's Japanese animation. Yep, that's why yep. we love it so much because it covers these topics that, you know, here sometimes in the States would leave people scratching their heads. Like, what am I watching? Mm, kind of like a little motif or kind of like a little take on our education system. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, it's been a long time since I've been in high school, Jack. Same here. So I don't know what it would be like today. No, no, but more, yeah. more aspect of like. I think more of a reflection of our society and it's like our class system. Yes, correct, yeah. correct. Yeah, and I, I don't know how many I don't know how many Disney films are going to tackle, <laughs> you know, are going to tackle that in the way that um, or Netflix when, when Kill a Kill did. Yes, yes. And uh, one of the things I like about Kill a Kill too is that their animation style. There were moments where it's like this felt like animation. Oh, um, and that's my yeah. number one, number one, number one, number one reason why I love Trigger. Yeah, they, are, I mean, it feels like you're watching. I mean, yes, it has this social commentary, and yes, it has these battles, and yes, it's beautiful and amazing. But there were moments where I'm like, it reminded me of The Simpsons a little bit. Yeah, it, Simpsons and pretty much traditional cartoon Looney Tunes, even. Yeah, it, you know, like there's a, a lot of there's a lot of moments where you feel like it feels like a cartoon. And other shows don't usually go that route. And Trigger does it in its own yeah. way, in its own special way with that energy and yeah. what Japanese animation at the end of the day does and what it has done before. It's just Trigger makes it more of their scope. Well, I'm, I like that it's able to do that yeah. while still doing the same things that other shows. Yeah, do. and it's counter art, too. I, I, yeah. I, I, I classify it personally as punk art. Like, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. You like you have, like, a motion of, like, being, like, similar, seamless to MAPPA, which is just a Kaisen with this fluidity. Well, I, I think that the, 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 ex the extreme nature of the artwork plays really well with the plot and the theme. Yes, yes. Like there's moments where Satsuki's face and uniform just fill up the entirety of the screen. Yeah. And it's just like, you're like, all right. Yeah, you know, it's like perspective is a key thing with Trigger. Yeah. Perspective to like, Especially in this show, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. And they almost with the uniforms that design themselves, too. Like Sasuke, she basically is infused with her uniform, even her traditional like get up, too. Because, uh, yes. Jumkits. Jumkits. Which Jumkits. was designed to, to be her wedding dress. Yes, ironically enough. Talk about terrifying. Yes, yeah. yes. And, yeah, like with her uniform as well, it's it's general-like, it's authoritative-like, and it has powers. Like Which was really odd because it's her. It's supposed to be her wedding dress, <laughs> but it looks more like a, like a uniform. It reminded me a lot of Esdefs yeah, yeah. from uh, Akamagakyo. Very much so. And I'm like, that's a wedding dress? <laughs> I'm like, okay. 
Yeah. But also kind of with the themes of the show, like you're conformed. Like wedding is a perfect way of being conformed. Like you're doing this your. This is true. It's th- a societal construct. Yes, yeah. yes, precisely. And you're part of our, you're going to help us grow. You're going to make us better with doing this, these acts, you know, being part of the system. Yeah. Well, they, they kind of play with that later on when their their mother has uh, Ryuku. Um, yeah. It, she ha- she forces Ryuku to wear Junkits. Yeah. And, that's, and yeah. she's trapped in essentially that wedding scene. And, of course, Mako has to go in there and save her, as she always does. Yep, yep. But, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what they use to kind of like imprison and brainwash uh, Ryuku. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, to bring you back to speed, basically that's the first half. Like the first half is Ryuku trying to find this confrontation or who killed her father. Turns yeah. out it's not Sasuke. Sasuke. Sasuke didn't uh, kill her Kiri, father. Uh, Kiriyuin did not kill her father. No. So essentially, so the first half of this show is essentially Ryuku fighting the system. Fighting the clubs, fighting the powers that be. Fighting, that, fighting fascism. Uh, through uh, revenge over the death of her father because he's been caught up in, like, the churning of this machine. Yes. And that's when you... And it's the second half of the show when you discover all of that was a lie. Beyond a lie. Beyond a lie. Because you come to realize that Satsuki is the daughter of... Ragu. Ragu Kiruan. Yep. She's the head of a conglomerate, a clothing conglomerate called Rebox that has spread their clothing all over the world for a specific reason. You discover that the life fibers that give these uniforms power are actually part of a primordial alien force made of string? Well, life fibers. And the- life fibers, but they look like string? Yeah. Because this is kill a kill and <laughs> it has to be absolutely ridiculous? Well, yeah. So we get into the whole nudist beach was an organization created by Satsuki's father in order to stop the life fibers who came here thousands and thousands of years ago and helped humanity evolve by giving them clothing. Being an anti-conformist. That's uh, I don't know what that means. So, okay. <laughs> so the plot is that these life fibers went dormant. They, they helped us reach a certain level of evolution and then they went dormant. And now they are awake again, and their plan is to take over humanity so as a fuel source so that they can reproduce enough to the point where they, can, they will destroy Earth, they will create more of these life fibers, enough so that they will feed off of the Earth and spread throughout the universe, and the cycle will happen again. Yeah, and that's pretty much like the evolution of clothing in its own right, from status, from primates to every century you can think of, we, where we got to today. And it's a it's a fascinating aspect of the show because... The show literally qu- quotes the Bible? Yeah, yeah. And they, they talk about how when Eve ate the apple, it brought shame, and Adam, you know, covered his, his genitals. Yeah, yeah. In the first aspect of clothing. Yeah. And, you know... Japanese animation, man. <laughs> and also, they will reference everything. Yeah, even French philosophy. And yes. Like, and uh, even with uh, Regu, she she basically is like this ultra being. Like I'm the ultra. Like she. Ultimate for, fashion. Yeah, yeah. It, it, precisely because that's where I was going with it. Like you would think like she would be like dictator. No, she's like the ultimate fashion icon model. Like this is my shit, yo. Yeah. <laughs> and she's queen, queen bee. Hairs are like a rainbow outlet kind of thing, sparkling with light. And you would think like she'd be like somebody you aspire to be, but no, 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 quite the opposite. No, she's corrupted to the core. Yeah. She is the, um, she's essentially the representative of the life fibers here on Earth. And it's her scheme to create this clothing that will essentially spell the end of humanity. And yes, yeah, it's set up like initially was letting Sasuke pretty much like do her thing with Hojin Academy, like build up like the army as it were for her. Yeah. Twist. This is part one because Twist Sasuke turns out to be the one <laughs> aiming towards her. Like, no, I built an army against you. Her father revealed the entirety of what was going on to her as a five year old. And yeah. so since she was five, it has been her plan to overthrow her mother 
and stop this plot to destroy the world. And those throwback uh, episodes are gorgeous because it's so yeah. similar to like an 80s uh, anime special yeah. like with the hairstyles and everything. <laughs> the extreme, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because um, It's all there. Ishin Matoi, that's the father of both Sasuke and Ryuko. Yeah. And Ryuko's little inclusion with the family is that she barely was even around with her mother and father. Mm-hmm. Or at least with her mother because the mother tried to do an experiment on Ryuko. Well, this is, the, this is one of the... There's a lot of twisted stuff in this show. Yeah. This is one of the main things that I think that you really get how evil their mother is. Yeah. Because her attempt to join the life fibers to her newborn child fails. And so she's thrown away like trash. Yeah. And I think it's at that moment where the father realizes, I have to get my kid out of here. Yeah. So he rescues her and transforms himself and goes into hiding, but prepares essentially prepares weapons to use in a battle against his wife. Yeah, for New Year's Beach and also for Yuku. Like he yeah. develops... Organization, uh, the Blades, and Setsuku. Yeah, Setsuku, who technically the uniform that's like more elite than the four-star is a Kamui. Setsuku, yeah. Setsuku is a Kamui, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. Kamui. Kamui. Which essentially translates to God robe. <laughs> yeah. Good call. I, I mean, know it gives them, yeah, it gives them godlike powers. Phenomenal. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The Dragon Ball uh, Z aspects of it, too, are yeah. apparent with that. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, Kamui transformed. Well, it literally transforms. Yeah, like, there's yeah. several, like, different iterations of it, which is, like, most uh, shonen. I mean. Like, we were talking, like, a jet uh, aspect of it. We're talking a berserk aspect well, of it. Well, there's the chainsaw. Yeah, chainsaw, yeah. There's a chainsaw. <laughs> there's the chainsaw version of this uniform. <sighs> then there's the rocket ship version of this uniform. <laughs> then there's the chainsaw rocket ship combo mashup version. Uh, <laughs> these the so these costumes are essentially mecha. Yeah, yeah. They're essentially mecha. The, the kamui are essentially gantly clad, or I don't even know how to begin <laughs> to describe to you. Let's just say the like... level of nudity in this show. Well, like um, I, like alluded to with Setsu, basically is like infused with Ryuko. Like you think in between nudity and clothing, like infused, it makes it more alluring, but also more spectacular. Well, in this show, like I think that you're gonna get over the nudity like within the first episode. Yeah, be, or the the first few episodes because it's just there constantly. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just, I mean, it's like, okay. Also, their demeanor, like uh, Satsuki, yeah. Satsuki, she's basically, she doesn't, she doesn't give a flying F. Well, no, because she's like, for her, in her mind, it's not about whether she's nude or not. Yeah. It's about how much power she yeah, has. Yeah, and sex is power. That's what I was trying yeah. to get with, because I always alluded to, like, Oscar dresses, like these beautiful, gorgeous people walking on red carpets. A lot of women with dresses like that, or at least actresses over the years watching the Oscars and stuff like that, they would have open, clo- open you know, cleave, o- open back, like yeah. very revealing. Like there's a sense of, like, how they presented itself to be a show of respect and power. And, of course, with porn and things like that, too, they take it to a different degree. There's aspects of how you view it, though, ultimately. And with this show, that's what they do. Because there's little gag bits, especially with Ryuku, how she handles it. And Ryuku is that hero that is not that self-conscious, but she also dismisses people's, like, perversions and things like that. And, and it's apparent, right? Well, she, she sees them in her mind well she's she's us yes, yes like i said before she's us so she comes from a different value set than this show than this this, this world yeah yeah the world of kill a kill because in the world of kill a kill i mean clothing represents like you know the power. fascist restriction power yeah so it, in the in this struggle clothing is the enemy literally yeah yeah not figuratively literally and so ryuku has to step in this world where Clothing essentially is the enemy. Yeah. Nudity is freedom. And so she has to make a choice. And of course, at first she's squeamish about it yeah. because it's like, what? This is insane. Yeah. But this is the world of kill a kill. And once you accept that, you know, like you said, you're granted power and respect because it's like, you're not shamed. Yeah. By this. Precisely. Yeah. Like we said, like we were, we were keep on telling with this uh, episode, basically, <laughs> that's the first half right there. Like you're getting along with like the anti conformity and things like that. Second half is a blur. I'm not going to lie. Second half is pretty hard to be like 
Where am I going with this? Well, because so many things happen. I mean, you have the introduction of uh, their mother, and then you have all of the reveals. The twist. You, yeah. you have the plot twist. You have Ryuku essentially going over to the dark side. Yeah. Uh, the realization that Satsuki isn't didn't, a villain. Yeah, didn't kill her father. Yeah, didn't kill her father, it's, it's, and she's trying to save the world. And that's essentially why she created Hojin Academy, why she trained all of her people, why she gave them the uniforms in the first place, and why she continued to battle Ryuku, even though she knew who she... She had an idea of who she was and why she was there, but she used her aggression and anger to essentially test the the limits of the uniforms that she had yeah. and to improve them. Everything that she's done has been in the service of defeating her mother. And you realize all that, and you realize that poor Ryuku has just been used by everybody yeah, and yeah. continues to be used until almost the very end. Yeah, and there, yeah, that buffer piece, like who actually killed uh, Ryuku's father, it turned out to be this entity, this uh, life form entity that uh, Ragu or Regu, uh, created, and that's Nui Harimi. Yeah. This idolistic, like, even more, like, annoyingly idol than... She's insane. Yeah. I, you, like, th- this show... She's just crazy. Yeah, yeah. This show goes to the depths of what I like and hate about villains. To the, Like, it does it perfectly, because Nui is the one I dismiss. I can't stand those type of villains. The anti-anti, like, what you used with the hero, because she's dainty and lovely, Super magically, super bubbly, her vo- tone. Oh my god, it, it drives me up the wall. But it's done perfectly. I respect that. You yeah, need good. She's, she's almost like from a different world. Yes, herself from from Kill a Kill world too. Yeah. And then same with uh, uh, Ragu, because she she's also like that perfect like type of like you will never touch me type villain. Like yeah. all the power in the world. The beauty. I am a goddess. Yeah, yeah. and Sasuke is pretty much my favorite type of villain. The wrong, not, not the, like the wrong villain, but more like the type of villain that you know she got her shit together and it's going to be really tough to t- topple her. And she's almost very close to being the hero. You just know it. But you don't know what to get well, out of it. Well, this isn't her story. No, it, no. It, it becomes everyone's story yeah. by the end of it. I mean, you have... It, it's... <laughs> it's bizarre... Because you have characters that are played for comic relief. Mm-hmm. Well, almost everybody in this show is played in one instance or the other for some form of comedy. Yeah. Even the, I've got two things to yes, say yes. to you guys. Trigger. Uh, yeah. That's literally his name, Trigger. Uh, yeah. K- Kingagasi Tsugumo. Like, he's, he's very... He's, Even him, there are moments where he's... The, you boy, know, the boy version of Ryuku, like total yeah, badass. Played for laughs. Yeah. But at the same time, they're there throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Like when Satsuki has a moment with Mako's parents, you're just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, these characters have been played absolutely ridiculously throughout the entire show. But here they are having a moment with someone who hasn't been. Yeah, yeah. They get and, room yeah. to shine and communicate. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's like it keeps somehow... Kill a Kill manages to balance that out. Very much so. And it's absolutely... It, I'm, I'm just sitting there. I'm like... Because you're... In, yes. Edwin initially I was sitting there <laughs> and I'm totally like, what? Yep, yep. Yeah, these people are from almost two different worlds entirely. Like Satsuki's character is totally, totally serious. Yes, yes. Throughout the entire thing. Uh, Mako's parents have been played for laughs throughout the entire thing. But here they are having a moment between you know between the two of them before the final battle. Yeah, and you're just like, this show gives no shits. No, no, no. It, it, it's like that was awesome because it's like you would have that moment in other places, or you maybe you wouldn't. But it's like all of these characters matter. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, nobody in this show is less than or they all pull their weight. Yeah, in one way or another. It, in this ridiculous contrast tone, well, it's of like show. Akuma got killed. Essentially, you have a revolution, and you know you have people that are fighting and struggling with each other in order to defeat an enemy. And it's like, regardless of their morals or their values, they've served a part, and they've been they've contributed in a way that gives them value. Yeah, yeah. And so here you are at the end of it, and you're like, yeah, these are all just people. At the end and, of the day. Yeah. yeah. 
And so they're kind of like almost on equal footing because of the sacrifices that they've made. You really see that in the closing yeah. of the final episode yeah, where it almost like comes back down to reality. Well, the least, at least like, Hey, we, this is definitely, we're almost done with this. There's finally the build that it's going to have a payoff. Well, there's definitely, I mean, the, the battle's a payoff. The, the battle's completely a payoff. Yeah. You get your, you've been, you know, you, you travel to space for a minute, <laughs> but you get that moment at the end We'll pass the ending. We need to talk about the naked group cuddle. <sighs> Should we talk about the naked group cuddle? Well, one discretion for as this as well with sexual overtones too. Yes, this show does not care about se- like we. Well, ta- it doesn't. Yeah. Well, see, the thing is that <sighs> like we like we were discussing. None with- of this is ever played for for sex. No, no. It's not. I, I, I mean, I mean, you can sure you can watch this show, and say, "Hey, I want, I want to see, I want to see nudie girls." Sure, you can sit down and say, "Hey, I want to watch these chicks fight battles in, you know, barely clad, scantily, like, you know, and find some kind of joy from that." But the nudity is never meant. That's never what the nudity is meant to be. I agree, and that's what I was trying to get at. Though ultimately, though, it is there. And, like, people could be like, you know what? That's not for me. Perfectly fine. Yeah. Perfectly fine. I, I commend you for that. Yeah. Because for me, when I first watched it, I didn't really think about it too much. And like I said, it was more of the zany aspect. Oh, these are cool fucking battles. Yeah. Here we go. But with the sex aspect of it, like, like whenever the life fiber is cut off or through that, you know, says, oh, shoot, whenever uh, Ryuka does her finishing blow. Senkets. Sen- or what did she say? Senshashu. She's on, she has like a, a, ta- a tagline every time she does oh, okay, it. Yeah. yeah, it's it's like getting rid of life fibers. And basically, they get naked. Like, that's yeah. play for laughs, LOL. But there's also aspects of like sex thrown in there, like with uh, R- Ragu, part of her villainous side. So be prepared for that, too. Oh, yeah. She, yeah. that was, I mean. Because I'm trying to build up with this. Well, I mean, she, yeah. she, you know, she sexually harasses her daughter. I yeah. mean, you can't get around that. Yeah, yeah. That happens. I mean, she spanks her ass when she has her like you know, held, holding you know she's holding her prisoner. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, that's absolutely uncomfortable uh, because she is a teenager, so that was uncomfortable. But you know, it goes toward who that character is. Yes, yes. Their mother is a villain. Yes, yes. She is a villain, and her her kids are like property to her that she can toss and throw away. Yeah. And so when she's defeated, you're like. Hell yeah. Yeah. And they needed what, to take her down. And that's why I'm trying to build up with this uh, and like the group. Well, cuddle. because the new, I, I, I didn't, the nude cuddle party, or. Well, it's not a party. Yeah. The nude, <laughs> it's an embrace. The, the group, the nude group cuddle at the ending is to save uh, Ryuku's life. Yeah. They all end up that way. I mean, they've given up their clothing uh, because they've given all the life fibers to Ryuku so that she can go and defeat. Their mother. End of the um, control, as it were, yes. Yeah. So you get this nude cuddle at the end, and I didn't see it as a I, – I, I wouldn't – the reason I wanted to talk about it was because I thought it was funny. Yeah, it's cute. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's a touching moment for all of them. Yeah. Because, yes, they have defeated the clothing, and, yes, they are nude together – and there's no judgments. There's no. There's no shame. There's no judgments. That's what I'm trying. Yeah. They've they've saved the person that they love, and here they are all together. Yeah, and yeah. it's almost back to being human. That's what I was trying to get at the end. Of the Most day. definitely. Yeah, yeah, because there's the two sides of sex. Like I said, that I have been trying to talk through this episode that you there either is respect and disrespect. And this one respects it at the end of the day, especially yeah. with the ending, because we're talking about embrace. Like we're back to being human. Yeah. And, and a family too. Like it's almost yeah. like a family portrait. Yeah. Yeah. And we're talking with the Elite Four, uh Mako's family. Mako. Everybody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's like a group like, yeah, we're uh, thank you. Like thank you for saving me. And you believe me all this whole time. And Riku, like, she's been the type of annoying hero as well because she she her own goals are more apparent than the bigger scope of things, like Edwin pointed yeah. out too. But well, now she's lost Senketsu. Yeah. Uh but now, you know, she has this whole family. Yeah. And she has these <laughs> she calls them her friends who are crazy. Yeah. You know, and they—they're all together. They're—they're they're the friends who are, you know, because that's who your friends are. Yeah. 
you know, they're the, they're the crazy people in your life, but you know, they're there for you. They're there with you and they're going to stand with you, you know, against all the things that happen to you. Yeah. It, in the final closing minutes, it's one of my all time favorites, at least with the ending wise, the final 90 <sighs> seconds, Edwin, like before we recorded mentioned it. And I'm like, yeah, it, this <laughs> show is, this is a Jack show. <laughs> This is balls to the walls, <laughs> crazy. Kill a kill is insane. But you love it. You love it. And you can't you, help you but do. love it. At, at the end of the day, you end up loving this show. And you give it all the things that you think you that might you walk into this show and you're like, oh my God, what am I watching? <laughs> what am I getting myself into? <laughs> and then by the end of it, you're like, that was a good show. That was a good show. That was an amazing ride. Uh, I'm glad I watched it. I ended up loving these characters. You know, thanks to Jack, I have a new like favorite girl, best girl uh, oh, in, in Satsuki Kiryu. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I don't think that you can walk away from this show without uh, appreciating all that it has to offer and just feeling like, man, this is now one of my favorites because it, it, it does take those risks and it takes those chances and it goes big, you know, in a way that isn't always, it takes risk, yeah, you know, and it takes chances and it says, Hey, this is what I believe. And here it is. Yep. yep. Unfiltered on, you know, like naked. Here is my <laughs> naked feeling about this. And you're like, all right. Awesome. <laughs> you know, you're like, you appreciate it. You appreciate it at the end of the day. You're like, thank you for your, <laughs> thank you for your naked honesty. Literally. You know, only, literally. The, only the way Trigger can, like yeah. you said. You it's know. like, it's like, it's going to tackle this subject and it's going to go, like I said, it's going to go big or go home. And these guys don't know how to go home. No, no, never. No. And yeah, it's the first ever Trigger and it's my, still my favorite. I still have to see in between ones. I still have to finish uh, Dizamon. SSS and or Grid or Gridman SSS Gridman. I liked I liked you that like one. that one a lot. Yeah, and I like that, one. That, that one has a lot of references to Kill a Kill as well. I can see that. Yeah, yeah. and Gur and Lagan, of course. That and, one was fun. My favorite is still uh, my Darling and the Franks. Um, Darling and Franks, uh, like more with uh, Guy and X, I would argue. And, I see that. Yeah. yeah, and that's the thing too. Like oh, triggering go uh, from here on out. They just did Star Wars Visions. The Star Wars Visions you need to definitely watch. Yeah. Little Witch Academia, uh, yeah, like oh my god, like they still have a lot of room to be like. Well, I think at some point we're gonna have to do like a Studio Trigger special yeah. and just talk about. I mean, I think we've covered a lot there, but we might have to bring in Martin and Jamal, and Jamal, and yeah, talk, yeah, because uh, they have their own favorite Studio Trigger shows. Yeah, and we're we're already talking about the top tiers ones, and uh, Kill a Kill for me, like it's the most ridiculous. And yeah, I was telling Edwin this, like even Darlene and the Franks has better story beats, uh, brand new animals, way better than I saw the so second time around. But something about Kill a Kill with that organic feel since watching it day I, one. I, I think yeah. that, like I said at the beginning, I mean, I feel that the, the, the story and the plot elements are almost secondary. Yeah. To, you know, like the artwork, the music, the battle scenes. That artwork. Oh, yeah. my God. And the relationships between the characters. I think that the relationships between the characters is the core uh, of that show. Yeah. Like, yeah, in Brand New Animal, you get, you know, there, there's the story beats. It's more focused on what's going on, you know, within the story. Uh, where Kill a Kill is like, yeah, you have your story. But it's it's definitely more about what happens to the characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And th with that said, hey. <laughs> that ends our discussion on Kill a Kill. Yeah, check it out, please, because this is one of the best. You guys will enjoy it. And now we'll be discussing Akama Ga Kill. Yes, part of our Kill special, part two. And like we mentioned in our Kill a Kill special, very similar to Kill a Kill. Like from the character designs to the demeanor to the battle scenes to a lot of influences uh, infused with it. Akame God Kill, it definitely has more stronger ties with Full Metal Alchemist and Sam, uh, Seven Samurai. I think this is one of those traditional shonen that kill a kill kind of parodies and it, it, it's pretty much straightforward uh it's a pretty much straightforward shonen 
Uh, Tatsumi is almost yeah, he's almost painfully your typical shonen hero. Yeah, and that's one of the things when I when I was rewatching this show, I I don't remember thinking this the first time I watched the show, but thinking it now that I've watched way more anime in the last ten years, thinking it now, I'm like the character designs and the costumes and the character designs. I felt were not as inspired as they could be, especially with Tatsumi. Yeah, like me and Edwin discussed this before recording too. Akame Got Kill is definitely of its time and definitely kind oh, yeah. of kindly weirdly outdated because it was popular as heck. Now it's back to normalcy. But last time I checked with my my anime list, it's about forty, ranked forty for all yeah, time. Still pop- a really popular yeah. show. It is. It's just a matter of like when you see it and when you exposed to it. Because I saw this way after a lot of great animes, and this one like took me a second viewing to really appreciate it. Because first time I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Yeah, well, like with most anime, you, you wouldn't uh, with more most so shows, this. Yeah. yeah, more so with this one because I didn't expect it to be like a Full Metal Alchemist type of ep- epicness. Well, I, I think what it is is that they're fighting an empire. But their costumes all seem like they're from modern day. Yeah. Which I thought conflicted with the setting that and they were in. And also, like, they would have, like, little things like uh, one of the characters is carrying Pocky. Like, is Pocky, like, there? Like, yeah. It, it, there's a weird juxtaposition to this show. Yeah. Where the character design was kind of almost drawn from modern day. Yeah. Pocky's uniform is just, almost looks like a school uniform. Yeah. With the sweater. Yeah. Talk to me. Yeah, and talk to me. That that always makes me laugh because he's. It's almost like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it does kind of look like that. Yeah. And uh, Akame, her outfit kind of resembles Ryuku. Ryuku's sailor uniform. Yeah. 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 To a little bit. The the tie kind of like threw me off. Yeah. Especially when they're fighting like danger beasts that look like they're from like uh, straight out of a fantasy anime. Oh yeah. So there's some weird juxtapositions in this show. It's just it, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. This is this is what you've been set up as. Uh, this is what you're given, and then you get into the fights. Oh yeah. You get into the fights. You get into the reason why Night Raid exists, and then you just get caught up in the show. Yeah, it's easy yeah. transition because from yeah you know, from the very beginning you get to see Tatsumi. He he's from the countryside, and you know he's looking for help for his village. He's going to the capital to try to earn money. Uh, he's been separated from his friends. Uh, he gets duped by one of the members of Night Raid yep. into giving her all his money so that he can get a commission in the army <laughs> and, and the- become a soldier. And yeah. that's the that's the that's the that's how that's your introduction to Tatsumi and the Night Raid. Yeah, and that character is Leon, the Beast Woman. Yes, and, big sis. Yeah, and she's you know in the city, you know, mind your own business, drinking, being part of the community. Well, yeah. she's taking advantage of the the naive boys from the from the the, yeah. the sticks, and, yeah. And Tassimi he quickly he falls ousts, for it. Yeah, he yeah. Quick, quickly allows her, and Leon has a playful way with him from the beginning too. Yeah. And she sees potential in the guy. She does because he shows up later on. This is how they decide to illustrate the dangers of the capital. Yeah. Like one of the soldiers, well, at the very beginning of the show, when he defeats a danger beast out in the forest to help one of the the, the capital guards, the guard tells him, oh, you don't want to go there. It's full of monsters. Yeah. And uh, Tatsumi doesn't understand. He's like, monsters? The monsters are on the road. And he's like, no, human monsters. Yeah. And he finds himself caught up in that corruption and that almost disdain for human life and where the, the people at the Capitol feel that the anyone who isn't them, anyone who isn't in power is beneath them and can be used in whatever way they see yeah. fit. And mind you, Tatsumi is looking for help. Like he's going straight to the Capitol. He would think they would help. Well, he's going to the Capitol because the, the taxation from the Capitol is ridiculous. Has left his uh has left his village almost broke. Yeah. And force them to leave so that they can send money back. Yeah, yeah. And it all goes back to the behavior and the corruption in the capital. Yeah. And yeah, initially, of course, like I said, the government is supposed to have your back. You know, they're supposed to protect you from monsters, things like that. And sure enough, Tatsumi goes past these wanted posters. And these wanted posters are some of my all-time favorites. Similar One Piece, kind of like a cool yeah. like <laughs> sketch design of these wanted criminals on the prowl. And that is Night Raid. Yeah. And so in the first episode, because Big Sis has taken all his money, he finds himself being taken care of by these nobles. Now, what he doesn't know is that these nobles are the daughter 
Arya, she essentially does this on the regular. Yeah. And because she's sick and sadistic, and she will take people in, and because they believe her, she will torture them to death. Yeah. She abuses them, torture them. She has her own little like torture room where she's killed like dozens and dozens of people who have come, who have taken uh, advantage of her charity, uh, as she likes to put it. Yep, yep. And so it's in this moment where he meets the members of Night Raid because they're there to kill Arya and her, her parents. Yeah. Because they've received a mission to do this, to wipe them out because of what they're doing. And it's in this moment where he battles Night Raid because he hasn't discovered this yet. And when he does discover this, he realizes that not only is this woman killing people, she's killed his two friends. Yeah, his two friends who were ahead of him during their journey to, to uh, they were missing at one point, right? They had become separated Yeah, uh, because uh, the, his friend didn't have a very good sense of direction. There you go, that's why. Yeah, and so they had become separated and so this woman killed both of them. Yeah. And yeah, very gnarly. And that it's also an introduction to the violence too, because you know, yeah, that's a good way to be like, hey, you know what? Okay, it's going that route, full metal alchemist route. I'm ready. Yeah, like I like we said, this show is not for children. And uh for this show, it's not about the nudity, it's about the violence and the language. Yeah. And the, the violence, it's not as graphic as some other shows that full, I can think of. I would of. argue that full metal alchemist is more violent. At times, too. It well, Full Metal Alchemist. There's more of a weight, yeah, to the deaths. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, the law of equivalent exchange is absolutely terrifying. Yeah, yeah. Because and then what people will use it for, and you get a sense of that here in this show with just the not, Empire. It's just not apparent, and that well, it's not apparent yeah. because they're not using it toward the end that they use it in Full Metal Alchemist. Here, it's just like, because they can. Oh, yeah. Right. Not because it serves a purpose, especially with uh, when you get into later, when our, we get into our discussion of Esdeath, she kind of does it because she can and she gets off on it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Kind of listen to the sick side of the villain. Yeah, and that's part of the reasons that they want to overthrow this empire, the yeah. emperor and his minister. Yeah. Kote is the emperor of, of the, the capital. Central of the, cap of the capital. That's the reference to Full Metal Alchemist as well. It's similar central. <laughs> kind of like this uh, tier circle circle type of like structure oh dude that's in every yeah. fantasy but anime. i immediately think of full metal alchemist even kill a kill like we mentioned with the school hanjami academy it's pretty much Circular, like yep, yeah. yep battleground too hey <laughs> yeah but uh this little boy he's the emperor kote and he has an influence and his influence is named honest yeah honest the prime minister who is anything but He's playing this kid like a fiddle, man. Yeah. He's Donald Rumsfeld. He's uh, Mitch McConnell. Yeah, we're getting political, but hey, that's he like eats good... meat in every scene that you see him. Yeah, he, yeah he... this guy is a gluttonous monster. He's disgusting. Yeah, he's a gluttonous, corrupt monster who essentially eats meat in every scene. And even the emperor comments on it. He's like, "Are you eating meat again?" <laughs> and it's like it's just gross. He's like, and then the way he like pulls at it and like. You're just like, it's. It, I think it's meant to get you, it's create that reaction within you, and it, they do it pretty well. I mean, the, the, the prime minister is just, he's just trash. Yeah, yeah. From top to bottom, corrupt trash, and you can't wait for uh, Night Raid to take him out. Yeah. Like, that was one of the battles, and oh, man, that one hurt. <laughs> that one hurt. Um, I'm going to let you guys know right now, this, is, this show is very similar to Game of Thrones. Because your favorite character will die. Either that or you just don't know. And that's a good playful way of doing it. And well, no, because it keeps the stakes real. Yeah, and the history um, real, too. Like, you don't even know a thing about this uh, environment, but you feel like the weight of the country itself being on top hole. And history is bloody. Bloody well, history. When I watch the... When, yeah, blood... I mean, revolutions usually are. Yeah. Uh, a bloodless revolution is rare. Uh, but when I was watching it the first time around, I remember thinking about Star Wars and how that plays out. And this was a while ago. So my idea of revolutions was a little bit naive based on, because I mean, you, you the, the story is pretty much this central, the story of this is pretty much a lot like Star Wars. Yeah, I agree. Where you have this revolutionary force that's trying to, you know, overthrow this evil emperor and this evil empire that is, you know, destroying the people or, you know, using them to their own means and all this corruption. And so watching Akamaga kill was kind of a little bit of an eye opener 
because I thought, yeah, this is the way like people would die. Yeah, and it's probably one of my favorites in that category because the stakes are there. It's not it's blo- bloody, 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 but it's also a complexity aspect of it. What do we do when we fix things up, or the things we have to do to overtopple the government? Yeah, yeah. real life consequences. Yeah. So it's one of those things where Tatsumi had to be in that focal point because he's naive. He's from the countryside, from the sticks. Yeah. And he's going in this battle headstrong, and he picks a team. He picks Night Raid, and Night Raid essentially is his family. That's the way that's the way it becomes. They become close with each other because this is a shonen, so he becomes close to the people around him, yeah. and they train him. And they're responsible for a lot of his emotional, you know, his professional and emotional growth throughout the show. Yeah, the structure of it as well. Like Edwin was mentioning with Leon, she's big sis, and she teases that. And I'm just your big sis, you know, even though she's kind of flirty with him. Then you get the little sister like mine, and then uh, Akami is pretty much like his kindred, kind of like the balance of the head, almost like the almost like the mother type of the family, because she wants to make sure everyone doesn't get killed. Uh, Shield's in there as well. The scissors wielding uh, <laughs> dits, but she's lovable. Yeah. And the big bro. Oh, man. He's a big bro. Bulat. Yeah. <laughs> I had forgotten a lot about Bulat yeah. because he dies so soon. He's like the second major death yeah. in this show. Yeah, yeah. And it happens, I didn't realize it, that it happens pretty early on. Um, that was like the halfway point. I would consider that more of the halfway point than what they allude to with the show. I think so. Yeah. I think so. But I think he had to die for Tatsumi to, for Tatsumi to grow yeah. more. And I think, but it was definitely like this show... You'll sit down, you'll start watching it, you'll be like, oh, this is just another shonen. Yeah. But it just it pulls you in and to the point where you start caring about these characters. Yeah. So when they do meet their fates, um, yeah, it becomes harder and harder. Yeah. And even Lobuck, I like I really have an appreciation of Lobuck the first time around. He's throwing mm-hmm. in there, he's you know, a confidant. And then also the second time viewing, I became more infatuated with the boss. <laughs> <laughs> the boss has got something going on. It's Colonel. I mean, yeah. yeah, she's. Uh, I, I agree with you. The second, <laughs> my second viewing, this character. I appreciate this character a lot more because in the first viewing, I just call her as kind of like a generic uh, Nick Fury. Nick Fury, to, like yeah. literally Nick Fury. It, yeah, it, it's nowhere not Nick Fury. <laughs> She, she assembles a team. She has the eye patch, and this, yeah, this it makes me appreciate this more because it did come out after uh, Avengers, and Avengers feels like it was filmed yesterday, and yeah. this one feels like it's older. So it's like a weird, like, oh my god. <laughs> well, I, I, because it goes for a pretty standard approach, yeah, and the artwork and everything. Well, it takes these, um, it takes character tropes and leaves them as they are. Yeah, it doesn't really try to change them. And so I think that's where you get kind of the feeling of like, okay, where it feels a lot older because these are like tropes that haven't changed in a long time. Yeah. And it takes these tropes, these character tropes, and just pulls them together into one narrative. It's like, this is going to be this kind of person. This is going to be this kind of person. This is going to be this kind of person. And they're very familiar. Yeah. They're very familiar. And the show doesn't do a lot to try to uh, differentiate that. Akame Got Kill isn't trying to break new ground in that way. No, no. It's trying to tell you its story in a straightforward manner. And it's not trying to break new ground. And I think that's why it feels a little bit more dated than other shows that came out at the time when it came out. But I think at the same time, I think that's what the creators were going for. They were like, we want to tell this story. We want to tell this story with characters that, you know, the kind of characters that we like. And that's what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it doesn't hesitate. It doesn't like falter. And no. th- there's a lot of funny moments. And they usually time mo- funny moments right in the beginning, oddly enough, I noticed this time around too. I'm like, oh, that's clever. Because, you know, you want that kind of moment to breathe. Yeah. And because the stakes are there, their missions are very like do or die. Well, because that they established that pretty early on. You're yeah. like, you don't know who's going to come back and who's not going to yeah, come back. Yeah. The stakes are like the way it does that is like kind of the the way that Game of Thrones did it, where it's like okay, you think you're watching a standard show, but who's gonna live and who's gonna die? Yeah, these are no slouches. Uh, mm-hmm. The big thing about the show too is what the mechanics are were given to our heroes, their superpowers as they were. So 
Tatsumi right off the bat doesn't have Imperial arms. Yeah. Tatsumi right off the bat doesn't have one. His Night Raid does. Yeah. Well, each member of Night Raid has their own Imperial arms. Now, the Imperial arms were created by the Empire a thousand years ago by the Emperor who wanted his empire to last, but he knew that he wouldn't be around forever. So he created these imperial arms in order to keep the empire going on for as long as he could. Yeah. And he created maybe about 40 of them. And each person in Night Raid has their own imperial arms, but they come with the benefit and a cost. Yeah. It's sim- similar in a sense of like uh, My Hero Academia, like with the powers. They, they quirks. Have, yeah. They quirks, but they have their limitations too. Yes. Briefly balanced. And, but you see how, which character, how they use their strengths. And that's another key thing with My Hero Academia because it's not just having that power, but how you use it. Well, yeah. I mean, and that's one of the things that I think Tatsumi learns throughout the show is that not they're, they're not, these people just don't solely depend on their imperial arms correct yes it's about their passion their training their experience all of these things play into how they use their imperial arms and he he learns that along the way oh yeah and like we've been mentioning like even though like he's in this new world this new purpose he has to carry out these gnarly missions well he's an assassin i mean they're they're essentially killing the people that would stand in the way if there was a revolution yeah Come, you know, come the revolution, these people would be obstacles standing in the way. Their corruption, their um, their the, disdain their for influence. humanity. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they would be a force of corruption after the fact. Oh, yeah. This is, Night Raid is their way of clearing the board so that they can get a fresh start. Clearing yeah. away the corruption so they can get a fresh start. But, yeah, it's, I mean, they're assassins. Yeah, and you would think like it would be cut and dry pretty much from the beginning there. Like, okay, Tatsumi is just going to get more powerful for each mission. I would argue not necessarily. No, it takes him a while to a get to the point. A long while, yeah. long while. When he starts out, he's still kind of strong. Yeah. I mean... He, he, he beats a uh, commander named Org, who's pretty much guts from Berserk. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, even in the first episode, when he beats that danger beast, I mean... It's a pretty impressive kill. Yeah, it's swift. I mean, he's fast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's got some speed to him. But these people with the Imperial Arms are a whole other level. Yeah. In his first con- a confrontation with our main, technically our main protagonist, the name of the show, Akami. Yeah. She has a deadly, deadly, deadly Imperial Arms. Yeah, that one, sword. A yeah. one-hit kill sword. Yeah. And she almost kills him. And yep. he realizes that. He's like, oh, shit. Yeah. It, he, it, he came pretty close to dying right there. Yeah. yeah. So basically, like, getting befriending with the Night Raid, even though he doesn't have an Imperial Arms, he's like, okay, you know what? I'll, I'll just carry on and help him out as much as I can. And after that kill with the general on his own, which is pretty impressive in his own right, yeah. the stakes get a little bit higher because one of the members, unfortunately, has an encounter with another person of the city. And that person uh, that got killed was Sheil, unfortunately. Yeah. And she gets killed by <laughs> one of the most unique characters of the show. The same voice as Rika from Jesus Kaisen Zero and Ichika from Queen Central Quintuplets. I hate to look it up because she sounded familiar. It sounded like Ryuko, actually. It was uh, Saru Ubiquitous. Ubiquitous. <laughs> Ubiquitous. <laughs> I hated this character. <laughs> I hated this character so much. Effective villain, though. Uh, so much. I, I almost hated her as much as Esdeath. Oh, wow. Uh, but I hated them for different reasons. Yes, and that's me with uh, yeah. ha- Hamey from uh, Kill Call. Yeah. Yeah. Seriu Ubiquitous is, is this woman's insane. Yes. I mean, she's absolutely, totally batshit like. She shouldn't be allowed to walk the streets. She's brainwashed. In any way, shape, or form. I, I think it's almost beyond brainwashed. I mean, like uh, embracing the brainwash. There you go. Well, she's like a, a religious zealot. Yeah. And like her quest for purity excuses anything. You know, her... her. <sighs> <laughs> I mean, oh my God. Like this character... Like, she's one of the characters I think that I might never forget. Yep. I might forget some of the other ones as time goes by. I'm never going to forget this character because she's just like oh my god so dark so like monstrous Very. and she's played as like this almost normal person to begin with well you could see consider her as normal too which is you know eerie 
very eerie. Yeah. And second time fear. Well, I think that's supposed to be the scary part about her is that she looks so normal. Yeah. But on the inside, she's hiding like this, like this insanity, this devotion to purity that excuses anything and everything. Like when she kills those thieves on the road, I mean, she just feeds them to her imperial no, arms. Yeah. No, there's no remorse. There's no no, no hesitation. None. Yeah. Whatsoever, and it's terrifying. Yeah. yeah. And these these are pleading too, and they. Well, the girl says she's like, I was just following along. She well, she's like, they forced me into it. All I want is a fair trial. Yes. She wanted a trial. Yeah. Because at a trial, she would survive. It's what you do. But no, ubiquitous kills them. She acts as judge, jury, and executioner. In a situation that didn't require an execution. Sadly. And yeah, yeah her, her period of arms is pretty gnarly. It's uh, it's half robot girl and half uh, chimera. And another reference to Full Metal Alchemist. Yeah, yeah. her little psychic buddy, Kuro, yeah, the is dog. the dog, is yeah. a vicious beast. Yeah, he was terrifying throughout the entire show. Like, Anytime they came up against him, I'm like, I was, I was questioning whether or not they would survive. Also designed similarly to Gluttony from Full Metal Alchemist. Yeah, a yeah. lot of Full Metal Alchemist references. Yeah. And yeah, you know, unfortunately, uh, Kiro eats uh, Sheil. And Sheil, wonderful, bubbly girl. And her arc was pretty cool, actually. Yeah. But ultimately, like this encounter. Well, that's one of the things that I was, I was kind of upset with the show. Yeah. Because I'm like, you guys did this on purpose. They did this on purpose because the episode right before is her episode. You get yeah. her backstory. You get her consoling Tatsumi after the death of his friends. Yeah. You know, he's he's sad. She helps him. She yeah. trains him. She helps him. She's to, the first one to take him in, too, I would yeah. argue, compared uh, to Leon. Yeah. She, well, I think she gives him a shoulder to cry on. Yeah. And she gives him affection. Uh, in a way that the other ones uh, haven't. Yeah, they're still and, testing and the totally waters. It's totally different. Yeah. It, well, it's an emotional thing, and she's there, and she's glad that she's able to be there for him emotionally. Yeah. And so they they give you all this about her. They show you her struggles, and then boom. <laughs> oh, man. I was like, <laughs> you weren't prepared. On purpose? Yeah. I, no, I wasn't prepared yeah. for this. I didn't know how high the stakes were going to be in this show. Yeah. Uh. They did that on purpose to tell you, no, look, no one is safe. The characters that you like, we're going to show you why they're likable. We're going to give you their emotion. We're going to make them human to you. And then we're going to take them away. Oh, yeah. That's what this show does. And because it's trying to show you these things aren't bloodless. They aren't. There are consequences. There are stakes to what these people have decided to do. Yeah. And that's one of the things that this show wants to do. And it does it. It does it really well. <sighs> yeah. And. That's one of the things where emotional toll was there. Yeah. And, and uh, Shields is a wonderful character. And uh, she's the scissor blade with the reference towards Kill a Kill as well, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> which is cool. But, I think you they know, were the, the, the scissors of creation. Scissors of creation. The Simil shears and, of creation. Shears of creation. And she yeah. has a similar story with, uh, with uh, Tatsumi as well, kind of like a revenge kind of thing. Ultimately, like, after that encounter, okay, pieces are starting to build together. Tatsumi's more inclined because of her fallen partner. Akami, of course, with her goal for none of her fellow assassins to get killed. Boss's inclination be like, we got to get these missions done. Like, each one has a goal. Yeah. Even L Lobak, who's very subtle with his goals. Blood as well, kind of like the you know fun, loving guy that's just there. And yes, what Edwin alluded to earlier, he was technically the second uh, key death because he has his battle arc that he had to face his former mentor on this mission on a boat. <laughs> and they faced these three p powerful guys. And one of them turned out to be his former mentor. And that was Liver. Liver. Well, this is Ezdef's first team. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's part of the show, too, because you get the introduction of Ezreth and her role in it as well. Yeah. And Ezreth is quite fascinating. She is a beast, a monster. She, yeah, she's a mon I hated. <laughs> I could not stand her. I, I could. I was like, oh my god, how many people have to die before they put this? She, bitch down? she wipes out villages. She, it's almost like the Flasher Stone and Full Metal Alchemist. She, yeah, she uh, talk about force of nature. Yeah. She's Elsa from Frozen, but, but the evil version. Even yeah. more than Iceman. I can't stand Iceman. Next man from Marvel versus Street Fighter Two. No, no, no. I, I, mean, <laughs> no, I, versus, I don't mean Marvel versus Capcom Two. I, I don't mean it. I, I don't mean in that sense that they, <laughs> that they that they have the same powers. Yeah, yeah. It's just the the level of power that they have. Like she knows how to use it compared to those two, at least with the vicious side. 
Yeah, well, she's on a totally different level from that. <sighs> I mean, it's just like it's an extreme that I was like, wow. Yeah, and yeah. she's sadistic. And yeah, and politically with the show, she's part of the Northern tribe. And she's the biggest ally towards the Empire. And and she increases the stakes. She puts the stakes of the show on a whole different level. Oh, yeah. Because until she shows up, you're like, oh, yeah, you know what? Night Raid has this. I mean, yeah, Cheryl's dead, but they got this. It's going to be okay. They're going to win. And then Esdef shows up, and you're just like, Holy what? Cow. I'm like, there's no way. Yeah. This is over. I'm, they they yeah. just need to, they need to shut this down and go home because they're all going to get slaughtered and killed because this lady's just wiping out entire villages. Yeah, her introduction is very subtle. It's very good build. It's I do terrifying, yeah. yeah. And yeah, then a little background with her as well because later on you get to find out that Najina, boss, Colonel Fury type, she used to be partners with her. Well, a lot of these, a lot of the, the Night Raid were former military. Uh, Bula and, as well, yes. Yeah, yes. and they've realized that they can't abide the corruption and just the, the decline of the the corruption and the... How do I put this? Uh, the nature of what the empire has become. I agree. Hardly, where human yeah. life is almost like there to be toyed with as, as a game. Yeah. Like the subjects are just like their toys. Yeah. And I think at some point someone even utters the idea that I think it's uh, the prime minister's son. And I think it's that moment that he has with, before Lubbock dies. And he's enraged by the fact that the the prime minister's son sees the subjects of the empire as his toys. And livestock and yeah. uh, similar to Kill Kill as well. You know, how they view the mass populace and they don't give a flying F what, yeah. what they're suffering for. Yeah. And Ezra is an embodiment of that because she's more of the side of like if you're if you're weak you're dead. Oh yeah, no, I mean yeah, no, she is like she is so twisted. Like they're the the subplot where she kind of falls in love with Tatsumi, which is a twist. Yeah, which was one of the things that was really weird about this show. It makes me curious. Not gonna lie, because as I've been told. Because I did some extended research because I was meaning to check the manga. I was looking for the first volume. Couldn't find the first volume. That's manga nowadays. Basically, I, I reached out to She Anime Podcast. Special shout out to you guys because they had a random thing of, oh, what's your favorite openings? I mentioned I can't make a kill because that's one of my all-time favorite openings. I'm, I love it to pieces. It's a great opening. Great opening. Music's phenomenal, too. And uh, basically, I was like, oh, yeah, I can't make a kill. And yeah, one of the hosts of She Anime Podcast, she basically was like, nah. I don't like the anime that one. Manga's way better. I'm like, great. Now I have to read the manga now. <laughs> but for the purposes of the anime, I uh, we were st- solely focusing on anime. I'm pr- pretty sure once I get the manga going, I'm like, okay, now I see. And that's part of me with that with that aspect of it, with the love triangle. I feel like that's part of the anime more than the manga. Okay. I can see that. Yeah. I, I think it's there to do a few things to show like a different side as the – Yeah. But I think it's also there to show Tatsumi that bad people are sometimes just bad people. Very. Uh, Because he does try to change her. He tries to bring her over to his side. Yeah. And as the show progresses, he realizes, I can't. Yeah. Well, There's no way. It's the aspect of Ezra to show, like, like she's so sadistic that falling in love is not normal. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, she does it. And everyone comments on that. Even the emperor. Because... Ezra, after doing all this crazy crap for the Empire, he asks her a simple question. What do you want? Like, I can give it to you. I'm the, I'm the of I'm course, the Emperor, and yeah. Honest is technically the Emperor, as we know. But basically, she's like, I want to fall in love. Like, what the hell? <laughs> I was not ready for that. <laughs> it, it was beautiful because she is a, like, she's sexy as hell, not going to lie, looks wise. But also, like, I never want to even look at this woman, what she's done. Yeah. And Tatsumi, of course, has that complex because out of blue, like, she has these demands <laughs> that fall into place. Like, she gives a list to the Empire of what she's looking for her mate. One that's good with hunting. Well, going back to Star Wars, it's like, you know, she's their Darth Vader. Like, even Darth Vader, like, has, like, an apparent mysterious side that's more respected. Yeah. Ezra is full on, I'm not hiding shit from nobody. No. <laughs> but she's like their Darth Vader and so for her to like come in and like it, it it's like can you imagine Darth Vader walking into the Emperor's throne room and says you know what what I really need is like uh to fall in love yeah and it, it would just you would just be like <laughs> what am I watching and 
and their demands, and she gives a list. She basically wants a, a person that has the aspirations to become a general, like militant, yeah. uh, can hunt, and has an innocent smile. <laughs> And they're like, it's impossible. This woman's impossible. <laughs> but yeah. sure enough, love at first sight because Tatsumi was on a mission to take out, be in this competition. Yeah. And it was supposed to be a night raid kind of like, like a ha ha, here we are, night raids here. Well, it was supposed to be kind of like a, a survey mission. Yeah, yeah. You know, a reconnaissance. Find out, get some information about what's going on and then, you know, we can back out of it. Well, unfortunately for Tatsumi... That's not the way his death works. No, no. No, she puts a chain on him from the minute he wins and sucks him into like <laughs> her, her life. The matching this uh, style. In the most uncomfortable ways possible. Yeah. And yeah, I have we do a storyboard for our characters to pinpoint our names. I have the picture of the Tatsumi smile. The smile that captured uh, Ezra's oh. heart. <laughs> his grinny like <sighs> Uh, yeah. it, it, that's the genius of the show too because they like even the, the funny moments are very funny and very cute yeah. but ultimately the serious tone and everything just throws you off and you're like oh my god i just love this <laughs> this show manages to balance it out better than other shows do to the, like a case study I yeah because it doesn't get as ridiculous as some other shows like kill to the kill. point yeah. well no kill a kill so when they were making kill a kill humor and ridiculousness was baked into it yeah uh, so it's not something that you can separate. Yeah. It's just, it's there. Just there? Yeah, it, it's, it's part of what it is. Yeah. Uh, but there are some shows where it's like, there's a really well-balanced nature to it in both Kill a Kill and here in Akama Got Killed. Yeah, yeah. There are some shows that will go to one extreme or the other, but not in an effective way. Yeah. Kill a Kill is all about being at extremes. Yeah, I agree. Akama Got Killed doesn't do that with its humor no nah, and you know? and like i said it's timely yeah. and it's perfect and yeah it, well it plays with it in ways that don't take away from the show yeah you know there are moments where it's like okay this is funny this is humorous but then it's like all right let's get serious yeah, yeah. and when it does it's serious yeah 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 where, where there are other shows where it's like the serious parts are just there like Oh, we're gonna spend you know seventy five percent of the episode being uh, funny, and then maybe for like that last twenty percent, we're gonna be serious. Not with this show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and that's pretty much like the weird takeaway with the show because uh, because of all the story elements, all the you know drama, the stakes are there, and the character deaths are there and apparent. We lose yeah. two key members of Night Raid already halfway through. But guess what? The boss is the boss for a reason. She finds some replacements, and the replacements yeah. these are these replacements could have done the job today, kind of thing. Yeah. We have Chelsea, Susan, yeah, Chelsea and Susano. Susano, yeah. And second time viewing, I appreciate these characters more. Chelsea less because Chelsea's at the end of the day was kind of annoying, at least for me. Yeah, Chelsea was one of those characters where it's like she was more modern. I think that's what that's what annoyed me to be honest. That and. She was overly confident, like too much to the sense of like I, which I don't like, which I do respect, but she did it in a way where I'm like, hey, you're going to get killed. Well, the first time around, <laughs> the first time around, that's the way I felt about it. Yeah. The second time around, I felt a little bit differently about it. I didn't think it was confidence. I think it was, for me, it was because she had lost her entire group yeah. of assassins before joining Night Raid. Yeah. And her being an outsider and looking in at Night Raid and seeing their kind of like camaraderie or their the com their camaraderie and like Tatsumi's like positive like like I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna accomplish this, his you know, his attitude toward everything. I think that she wanted to save them. She and so I think she pushed herself further than she should have. Okay, I will get, she put herself out on a limb for them yeah. to try to protect them. And and that's a good think, point. Yeah. yeah, I think it ended up backfiring because she didn't realize how much had been done to Kurame to create that kind of a monster where everyone else she killed died. Yeah. But Kurame was this, you know, this, Kurame was a monster. Yeah. You know, created by the Empire, you know, as an assassin, yeah. uh, as their own personal assassins. In, for context. And so Chelsea. It's like Chelsea's like, oh crap. Yeah. 
and she pays the price yeah. for coming up against one of the and it was that was a sad one yeah it was a sad death it was and that, that was probably the most gnarly of the bunch i fired pick one and yeah it was like one of those things which which edwin put, put up excellently because it was okay because yeah th- it, she went rogue and she never goes rogue and yeah. that's what happens uh, eventually. And for context, this is like the in between battles between <laughs> uh, Night Raid and Jaegers. Yeah, well, she was she was more of an assassin than the other assassins because at she, the end of the day, I would agree there because too. her Imperial Arms was a subterfuge, the, the, the makeup box. Yeah, and, and tra- transfuse. Yeah, that allowed her to become essentially whoever or whatever. Yeah. And so being on the offensive that way, I don't think was something that she was prepared for. No. Yeah, because she didn't really have any offensive weapons. It was all subterfuge. And so when she has to fight against Gurume and her, you know, her summoned underlings, <laughs> uh, which is the power of her Imperial arms, she kind of didn't stand a chance. And where the other ones... She suffers a fate a little bit worse than the others because she's beheaded and her head is put on a pike in the middle of the center of the the town. Yeah, and then her body is fed to the Kuro. The, the Kudo, the dog. Yeah, and so it's like, wow, man, this is <laughs> wow. Yeah, and her fate is. I mean, it it knocks Tatsumi for a loop. Yeah, and yeah. during that sequence, uh, basically because these two new members are not too assimilated, but they're respectable. Well, Esdef gets since um, since Bulat was powerful enough to destroy to take out her three uh, little pets. Yeah, she has to get a new group of pets, which she uh, names the Jaegers. And the Jaegers are an interesting group because they're pulled from all across the Empire. Similar to Night Raid. Similar to the Night Raid. But at the same time, they're not what I was expecting. The, it's similar to Kill a Kill again with Sasuke. Uh, basically, they're following the leader. They yeah. believe in the leader. They it, really do. Yeah, and similar yeah. to Boss as well. And uh, Night Raid, in its own right, is doing for a noble cause to overthrow the uh, Jaegers, as Edwin pointed out to me before we recorded, the name itself, Hunters. Yeah. In German, yeah. Yeah. And then, well, one of the interesting thing is kind of like the yin and yang nature of these two groups. Very much so. Especially with Wave. Yeah. Because Wave is very, very similar to Tatsumi. L- the, almost designed and almost like its own parody of itself of a shonen hero. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't see it so much as a parody as an introduction of this idea that here you have a person, pretty much a good person. Yeah. He defends his friends, and he believes that he's fighting for a just cause. Yeah. And it's not until much later in the show where he realizes what's really going on and what he needs to do and how he comes to the assistance of Night Raid because of all the things that he's seen and experienced. Yeah, good call. And yeah, it's what Tatsumi could have been in the beginning from all we know, if he would have helped Oh yeah, him. I mean, very yeah. easily. If Big Sis <laughs> hadn't left him homeless, this story would have gone very differently. I agree. Yeah. And then the same way around uh, with the with Jaegers in its own right for their own just causes, but in Wave's case, is definitely to help out his town, similar to Tatsumi. He believes he's fighting for a just cause, yeah. and he believes it's his job to protect the people of the Empire. Yeah. And he feels that Night Raid is a criminal organization that is killing people with impunity. And more violence upon it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes you need to do it within, which we find out later on as well. Yeah. The Yeagers is a built team with Sairu. She's in it. She's thrown in. They're ubiquitous. They're ubiquitous, they're which seeing her again, <laughs> I was like, with Azareth, oh, no. Edwin's just like, what the fuck? No, not these two. <laughs> not together. No, no. Oh, God. Yeah. And, and then Vekwitis, she's similarly designed to Chelsea, fun fact, I would argue. And, and then Bowles is similar to Bula, kind of like the big big oof kind of thing, but also yeah. very powerful. Uh, Run, he's, he's similar. He's like a combination of Leon and Lubbock, I would argue. Kind of like um, gangly, kind of like weird character that's blonde-haired. And yeah, if, yeah. if Leon was a boy kind of thing. And then uh, finally, what Edwin mentioned with one of the other uh, assassins, Kurome, who turns out to be Akame's sister. That backstory was really tragic. Yeah. Yeah. 
Because even though Night Rage is facing against this enemy, they're also very similar and very akin and very personal. And Karome is that exception because she's literally the embodiment of uh, Akami. Yeah, she's her sister. And so they were, as children, um, they were kidnapped and taken to the Empire and essentially kind of like thrown into a battle royale. Yeah. To kind of similar, uh, similar into the way that uh, similar to Demon Slayer, okay, in yeah. which they have to fight and survive through the this, forest, yeah. through the forest, yeah. yeah. And so her and her sister uh, Akame and Kurame, uh, they manage to survive, and they're trained to be assassins, but they're also separated um, forcefully. Yeah, yeah, they're forcefully separated, and at a certain point. When Akame comes back to the capital, she's reunited with her sister, and they essentially become assassins for the capital. Yeah. So anybody that the capital wants them to kill, they kill. But Akame realizes that this is not something that she wants to do. No. Uh, she realizes that the the empire is corrupt, and she needs to leave. Yeah. And so she leaves, and in leaving, she sets into motion her sister's... Um, <sighs> Her sister's feelings of abandonment. Yeah, that and... And that's what drives her more than anything else because she's lost all the people that she loves and she wants her sister to be by her side forever. Yeah. And she has an imperial arms that could make that happen. So her sword allows her to command whoever she's killed. Zombies. Yeah. Essentially, like a necromancer... To raise an army of the undead. Yeah. A cursed sword similar to Akami's. Akami's, like we mentioned, is a one-hit kill type of poison poison sword, essentially. Yeah. Well, in a way, they're similar in that uh, where Kurume can actually literally summon them, yeah. uh, summon the people she's killed. It's kind of like their mindset. Yeah. The evil people's mindset. With, with Akame, she has the sword but can't raise the dead, but she carries the guilt over these people's deaths. Yeah. So she will always carry them with her and that gives her strength, but it doesn't give her an army. Yeah. Whereas with Gurume, it gives her an army because she lacks that guilt. Yeah, she's killed these people. She doesn't feel remorseful yeah. or guilty about good it. Call, good call. And so they're she's they're able to she's able to summon them as her weapons. Yeah. Talking with this it maybe dawn on me like how unique Akami is because first time viewing it, I thought she was just like kinda like cool badass character, Lady Snowblood in the team of us great assassins. Yeah. But Akami, like the name itself, well, why is it called Akami? Like even during the intros, they focus on her. And during the stories, technically Tatsumi is the hero and the main character because of what he learns along with the journey and the ride of this uh, rebellion. Akami is feral. Akami has these weird little traits of eating too much and like being a motherly figure. Context, her sister. Oh my God, it was a revelation because it was like, okay, she had to survive with her sister on her own in Hunger Games like environment. Yeah, I would be feral. I would eat as much as I can and, you know, train, 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 survive all the fittest. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, it dawned on me until now. So, Adwin, hey. Yeah. She, she's all about the survival. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if this is right, but Aka means red and ah. meh means I. Ah. And it is called, uh, the, the production that's called Red Eye Sword yes. production. And so I'm like, is that, are they playing around with like, is that li the literal translation that's of her name? Red Eye? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good call. Because, yeah, it, it builds up to that because it's Jaegers versus Night Raid. Here we go. Yeah. And like we alluded to earlier with the Kill a Kill and how they're similar with that is the bail aspect of it. Like at the end of the day, you're getting all these little setups, all these little payoffs. Battle. Here we go. Well, Najade, their leader, um, she essentially tells them, like, when people who have imperial arms face off, usually one of them walks away dead. Yeah. It's like, and that's what happens. As Night Raid starts to fight against the Jaegers, the, the battles are huge. Yeah. Because, you know, Gudame has, like, a, a danger beast, you know, an AS-class danger beast <laughs> in, her, in her possession. Oh, yeah. Plus all these other people, and you're like, man, Night Raid has to fight. Like it gets frustrating. I got, yeah. I got frustrating watching it because I was like, oh my god, 
how many people do these people have to fight yeah. in order to save this empire? Yeah. The, literally, the only criticism I can think of more I think about of this show is that you're thrown in a loop with like, okay, here's another four people. They're Imperial arms. Four people, three people, like the general. Well, Gudeman, I thought, was interesting because you think she's just like uh, Akame in that she just has a sword. Yeah. And so you're prepared for and that. And an appetite, yep. You know, but surprise, surprise, her sword can essentially summon an army. Yeah, yeah. So the tables get turned yeah. because... And the power lovers are in flux. Yeah. My... When Night Raid walks into this thinking they've trapped three of the the Jaegers. Yeah. You know, they've separated them by fooling them and they think, oh, here's the whole team. We're going to be able to take out these three Jaegers because they're what's standing in our way of, of, you know, of the rest, of the revolution. Will, the dominoes yeah. will fall. The dominoes will fall. Unfortunately, surprise, surprise, plot twist, Gudame's power enables her, imperial arms enable her to summon an army. Even Akami they didn't even know that. No. Yeah. So you have this arc where it's like, all right, we're screwed. Now we have to fight our way out of this. Will we all survive? And they almost don't. They almost yeah. lose uh, Leone. Yeah in this and they do end up use, losing Chelsea because of it. Yep, yep. Yep. And uh mine was taken uh was supposed to be like their backup and she got distracted too. Well, Things mine like that, can yeah. mine gets sucked into uh to toad. <laughs> she's trying to fight Kudame. <laughs> yeah. Uh and she can't because yeah. Kudame has all these little sidekicks and then she has a surprise surprise another one. Yeah. A toad. And so they never make this easy for Night Raid. This show is kind of infuriating because it's like, all right, I have to accept it for what it is. Yeah. This is not going to be one of those shows where they skate in easily. There's going to be deaths and conflict, yeah. and it's going to be a struggle and a slog all the way to the end for these people. But at the end of the day, too, where that's frustrating, it's also part of the one of the things that I like about the show. Yeah. Because they struggle till the yeah. end. The payoffs are there. Yeah, the, the payoffs, payoffs are, are there. there. Yeah. They struggle till the very end. Yeah. Nobody survives this. Yeah. And my first inclination of, of uh, inspiration, Seven Samurai. Seven Samurai, watch it. You'll learn. And I can I can see that. Yeah. yeah. It's one of my all time favorites, top ten. Yeah. I've seen a lot of movies. That's so still yeah. a top ten. Yeah. And yeah, this is like a perfect way to like trans yeah, you know, if you watch anime and you learn from anime and cinema, yeah. I, I can make that kill. Seven Samurai. Like it's a good perfect seamless transition. Yeah, you get a lot of references. There's yeah. there's and that struggle and that fight and losing these teammates along the way. The ones you endure with and ones you yeah. learn from and grow with. Yeah. Oh, my God. The heart strings, man. Yeah. Their death scenes are not just throwaway no, either. No, far from it. Which far. I was kind of glad. Even, even bulls. Even like a character I don't care about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, everybody gets like their emotional moment yeah. to, to shine. And I appreciated that because it's a little cheesy, but I think that the characters get a deserved moment. Yeah. Like with Big Sis, she's the one who kills the minister. Yeah, yeah. You know, she beats him to a pulp, but he's able to destroy her imperial arms. And shoot her. Yeah. And shoot her repeatedly. Yeah. And she's able to go back to her... You know the neighborhood where she grew up, and that's where she dies. Yeah, that's there. And I thought that was a nice. I mean, I get that she should have died in that hallway. Yeah. Uh, she shouldn't have had a moment with uh, Akame. We're saying goodbyes essentially. Yeah. yeah, she shouldn't have had a moment with Akame, and she shouldn't have been able to go back to her home. You know, to her neighborhood. But I'm glad that they did that because it gave her the moment that I felt that she deserved. Yeah, for sure. It gave us that closure. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you have this wonderful, like, roller coaster of battles, 12 episodes worth, I would argue. And little by little, seeing their pair arms. Oh, just, yeah. just like Kill a Kill, man. That second half flies through yeah. because it the, is battle uh, after battle uh, after battle. Akami sells it out better. Uh, uh, kill a kill, you're not prepared. That's the only difference. Well, because with kill a kill, it's a lot more insane. Yeah. There's a lot going e Even on. for me. And, yeah. and even second time, third time viewing it, like, huh, I don't like these parts. <laughs> I like it when it gets a little bit more focused. I'm like, oh, okay, there we go. Fine. Well, because there is a rush through because there's so much going on. Because yeah. Because the the focus for Kill a Kill at the beginning is just Ryuku versus Satsuki to the death for, you know, revenge purposes. 
So there's a focus to the narrative. But when you get the story finally opens up, there's a lot more going on. And so, yeah, it gets kind of hectic. With this show, it is a little bit more balanced because one of the crazy parts is that they're killing characters off. Yeah. And so you're able to focus more because it actually works in the exact opposite way because as they move toward their goal, there's fewer and fewer characters that you need to focus on so the story doesn't uh, segment the way it does with Kill a Kill. Yeah. There's a narrative focus because there's fewer and fewer characters for you to focus on. There's fewer and fewer fights. Yeah, good call. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, oh, man, like it's so overwhelming, even second time viewing, seeing all these great battles and stuff. And you know, you still know what happens. And you still be like, oh, my God. And like you mentioned with Lobeck, like second time viewing, I appreciate Lobeck more. And so he, did I. And his so uh, I. fortune. Because yeah. to me, the first time around, he was like a, the generic little perv. Otaku type, kind of like yeah. in his own world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought, okay, he's like one of the most modern characters I felt. Yeah. Like, okay, they just pulled this guy right out of like any anime. <laughs> you know, like, you know, he even has the headphones. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was like, the hairstyle. Yeah. I'm like, do they even have electricity in this <laughs> world? Chelsea, does... too. Chelsea had headphones, too. Yeah, I'm like, how do, <laughs> what are they? And my thing is, what kind of music are they listening to? Yeah. It's like, in, in mine, uh, her, are they using cassettes? Yeah. Are they using, you know, record player? Do they have like a record player somewhere <laughs> on their body? You know, like one of those little crank things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, ultimately, as I was trying to mention, like Kill or Kill, like I don't have really favorite battles in that one. Like I said, it's, I feel like it's a one epic battle after in uh, the same battle in a weird way. Akami got Kill, similar to Jujutsu Kaisen. Their best battles, and oh my god, if I had to pick one best battle, whew, Edwin's gonna like this. It's mine versus uh, Ubiquitous. <laughs> That's my favorite battle over Akami versus Ezra. Yeah. <laughs> that battle pissed me off. It, I know. It's infuriating. Ubiquitous just wouldn't stop. Yeah, I know. I was like, give it up. But you lost. Stop trying to hurt people. Yeah. For me, even to the very end, she's like, oh, now I have a nuclear missile. And I have, a, you know, a, <laughs> I have a small nuclear warhead inside of my, my tooth and I'm going to bite down on it and it's going to blow everything up. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Lady, <laughs> just die. Just go. God be with you. Just get out. I was like, Ugh. it was so frustrating. For me, it was the tr character transition and the payoff with mine because mine the whole time was annoying, like little sister. Like, yeah, I don't want to talk to you, Tatsumi. Get away from me. But, you know, she has her heroic moment because she avenges Shield and she protects uh, Tatsumi. Yeah, she and, does. And yeah. it's a revelation. I won't spoil that one, but it's. Well, I, I think that it was growth on her part as a person yeah. because before. She had been fully, this was solely about her survival. Yeah. That was just her, that was her motivation. Yeah. And it with was her, like, yeah, yeah. with her, I back, will survive. Yeah. I will make it through this. Yeah. And that's who she is. Yeah. A little yeah. context, similar to Akami, she pretty much was homeless and feral. And yeah, she was a foreigner. And that's kind of like shunned upon, similar to Full Metal Alchemist once again. Yeah. But ultimately, like, she gets this Imperial Arms pumpkin. It was a deadly ass missile. It's the most badass weapon of them all because the more dangerous she is and the more blast radius it is. Yeah, some of the best shots in the show are her gun. Oh my god. Well, yeah, it's it's a weird thing that the level of power that her gun has is based on how much danger she's in. Yeah. Or her emotions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Too, which is how she's actually able to take out Serio Ubiquitous. Because she's realized that she has feelings yeah. for Tatsumi. And, and, she has another reason to live. Yeah. And ultimately her demise, too, because she faces a powerful uh, foe. And then she conquers, but it costs her life. Yeah. yeah. And then her... <sighs> I know. The, 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 her weapon is like... I'm like, that was another thing where her weapon was like, what is this weapon doing? All the here? Imperial Arms, I argue. Like, Ezra's, like, trump card. like, And that's the big thing with these weapons. All of them have, like, a, a second ability, a trump card. Well, I mean, it's not the trump card. It's just that the nature of this, like, super awesome, like, futuristic gun in the middle of this fantasy story. And I'm just like, <laughs> what is this even doing here? Harvard. But it's like, yeah. you know what? It's it's Akaman got kill. You have to accept it. Accept it. Accept the battles. Because, yeah, we can't recommend this one enough. I, part of me wants to finish. I liked yeah. um, the oh, battle right. between Akame 
and Kurame. Ah, um, okay. And not only because it's the two sisters fighting, but you have kind of like that yin and yang again. Yeah, yeah. Where you have Wave and Tatsumi kind of like... They're cheerleaders. <laughs> 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 well, that's one way to yeah. put it, Jack. But yeah, Wave is a little bit more apparent with his feelings with uh, uh, Kurome, and yeah. Tatsumi just has respect overall with uh, Akami. So yeah. yeah. Well, it definitely. Well, I I don't think that you know Tatsume is your standard uh, shonen protagonist where he's not in this for the love. No, no, it's the, for the mission. Yeah, for the mission. It's, it's the battles. Yeah. And I got that, and that was fine with me. All the other people kind of are crushing on him. <laughs> uh, Akame, not so much, because it's like you said, she had, went through a, a Hunger Games kind of, like her thing is survival. She just throws you off. And similar to yeah. Tatsumi in a way, has a goal, main yeah. purpose. That's well, it. Tatsumi, well, he's always the main guy. Yeah. But he becomes one of the most powerful ones, too. Yeah, yeah. Because he, uh, we didn't mention this earlier. He get he adapts uh, Bula's power of Incursio, yeah. the shield-like uh Entity uh, the armor, yeah, yeah, shining knight uh, kind of thing. Yeah, so. and so he's he actually goes up against the emperor, who also has an imperial arms, and I think that was the height of like we are the empire, we are the imperium, we will rise up and destroy anyone that stands against us, even if it's our innocent citizens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's the theme of a the show too, like power destroys all kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And then Tatsumi doesn't even die in the battle. He dies trying to save people in the end. And that was like, I thought... You, you think he would survive like because of all the ridiculous like elements of the action thrown in there and how people bounce off of well, walls, he, he things already, like that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, well, a wave... Well, that's one of the things that I go back and forth on this show. It's like, it's like yes, this isn't ridiculous the way... This isn't zany the way Kill a Kill can be. You're meant to take this seriously... And even there's an incident where Wave is thrown like three miles. Yeah, by Su Susano. <laughs> yeah, and the only thing that saves him is the fact that he lands on his Imperial arms. Yeah. But he's hurt and can't move for a while. Yeah. And so there's consequences to these battles. And sometimes that's played up, but that's always in service of the plot. Yeah. And so I thought that was a little, that kind of annoyed me a little bit because it's like, all right, you're going to set up stakes and these people can die, but then you're going to kind of play around with the physics a little bit. It's like, how much damage can these guys really take yeah, as human yeah. beings? I know. Yeah. It's part so, of the suspension of belief kind of thing. So you get to the yeah. point where, you know, um, Tatsumi's in that battle and he's in that position, then it stops being his show. Yeah, yeah. Because he, he dies. And thus the title, like I alluded to earlier, is technically Akami's show. Now she's there, and it's her job to get revenge, to save the, you know. Empire. To save the empire and get revenge for every all of her fallen uh, enemies, or all of her fallen comrades, because as the boss states, that Esdeath is really the one thing standing in the way of a better world. Yeah, like mm -hmm. we mentioned earlier, too, like, holy shit. And like, that battle is epic. Yeah, I, and no slouch with that one. That's my, technically my number two, but, man, I love the, I love Pumpkin just going through <laughs> ubiquitous. Yeah, oh, that that was... <laughs> it's glorious. <laughs> Chef's kiss. <laughs> when she cuts her in half, I was like, oh. <laughs> but... Ubiquitous steals it away from what should have been a satisfying ending to Oh, her. yeah, that's true. How she could She steals I it agree. away from me by trying to kill my... Be self-righteous. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like... <laughs> <sighs> it was so... I was so upset about that. But, I mean, overall, this show... This show delivered... I like this show a lot. Yeah. There was, like, some things that bothered me about the character design. And, like, once you forget about all that stuff and you're, like... Once you accept the fact that they have technology that maybe they shouldn't have. Yeah. And, like, they've been drawn from, like, they've been pulled from different animes, their, you know, their styles. Once you let that stuff go, it's really enjoyable. And I liked it the second time around. And yeah. I had to make a goal for the special episode because it's the Kill special. We're talking about Kill a Kill, one of my all-time favorites, one of the ones that really got me steamrolling with this anime stuff. Studio Trigger's first production. Oh, my God, special, special to my heart. Akame got Kill, I like more. Or as really? in, I think I like, or I, I still have to decide which one I like more. I think Akami Got Kill is better. It's a tough, bold, bold statement on my part. Well, I, I think that for me, they're different. 
They're different. Yeah. Don't so, get me wrong with well, that. Well, I yeah. think when you approach them, for me, I think that Kill a Kill does what it does better. Yeah. And for your second viewing, you appreciated more of that. Yeah. Well, I had never watched Kill a Kill before. Oh, I thought you did. No. What? What? Yes. What? 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 Yeah. what? what? This, You're killing this, me, Smalls. This was my special. <laughs> This was my special for you. And that's my special to you because I'm at the end of the day, Acme is just a better story and structure. Well, I, I think that, well, like I said, the, the, the point of Kill a Kill is not, the story <sighs> is kind of like on the back burner yeah. for Kill a Kill. Yeah, yeah. It's not, the point of that show is the, you know, like I said, the battles, the art, the music, the relationships. That's the point of Kill a Kill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you go in there and say, I want this story to make sense, you're only you're only hurting yourself. Yeah, that's true. But I think that when it comes to the things that Kill a Kill does, I think it does them better than Akama Ga Kill. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the story for Akaga, Akama Ga Kill, I think it handles it better. But I think at the same time, and, you know, you, you care about these characters and the stakes and, you know, when they die... You know, it kind of hurts. You're like, yeah. wow, man, I, I I grew to like this character, and now they're gone. And, I mean, would there have ever been another season? I don't know. Yeah. But there's not a possibility for these characters to come back. That's true. You know, like when Big Sis dies, it's like, you're like, damn. Yeah. Well, there's no coming back. Yeah, there's no, no Marvel bullshit. No, admit, it's... Yeah. it's <laughs> I know. There's no... Well, it's not, you know... it's it's, it's Nobody it's, really dies. There you go. Yeah. And well, in this, they do. And so, yeah, there's that sadness. But for me, I felt that Studio Trigger managed to do what they were aiming to do a little bit better than with Akama Ga Kill. Okay. But my thing is, it's like, I don't... You, You're not going to compare. There you go. Well, I think they're so... They're different enough where... Like, if I have to take it objectively... For me, I still liked Kill a Kill better than Akama Got Killed. Yeah. And but the, the thing is that I enjoyed both of these shows. In different contexts. Totally different. Yeah. Because Kill a Kill is a, a parody satire of the shonen genre where Akama Got Killed is flat Fire. out, point stop. This is a shonen. Yeah, yeah. That's it. And that's my conflicting nature yeah. as, a, as well. Like that, you need to kill a kill in your resume, and something, or or at least something you love so much you can't explain it. For me, with like Ninja Turtles, for example, or with yeah. like lots of other ones too. Uh, Mortal Kombat the movie. That's another one. Well, it's it's like with me. It, I think it depends on when you watch it. Yeah. Like for me, like, and we'll be talking about this coming up. Uh, in a, in a few months, but like my favorite Studio Ghibli movie, and Nausicaa. is Nausicaa, yeah. and I think it's probably because I watched it at that sweet spot that you know, that was my first one that I watched, and that was the I watched it when I was uh, you know a young adult. Yeah. So it stuck with me, and then it also it's sci-fi. Is it the best of their movies? I don't know yet. I'm to, still to, watching. To I'm still watching them yeah, to be continued, yeah, yeah. but for me, it's my favorite, and then it'll probably always be my favorite. And for me as well, Monaki. I agree. Yeah. yeah. See, so we're always gonna be, and I don't want to take these. I don't want to say which one of these shows was better, uh, because I enjoyed both of them, and I thought they were both really great for what they are and what they do with it. So, yeah, I mean, I think for our audience, they're, both of them are well worth watching. Yeah. I think that you'll walk away. I don't think you'll regret watching either of them. I think you'll enjoy both of them, and you'll look for more. Yeah. You'll want to watch more shows like this. You'll want to watch more Studio Trigger. You'll want to watch more Shonen because Akama Ga Kill will leave you with that feeling of, like, I want to I want to go on that ride again. Both of these shows will leave you feeling like, I want to go on that ride again. I want to experience these. I want to see these characters. I want to see characters struggle. I want to see characters grow. I want to see characters become more than what they yeah. can be. In, in different viewpoints. Like, this is years yeah. later watching these both. And, or yeah. at least, like I said, uh, third time for Kill a Kill. I saw it not too long ago. I would say two years ago. Now, this time. Because this time is even more apparent and different than the last two times I've seen it. I think things change as we watch more anime. Oh, yeah. That's and it. as we discuss it. Yeah. Because as we discuss anime, we get into, like, what makes these shows what they are. Or better understanding, too. Yeah, yeah. so... As we come toward it, we're bringing all of that experience when we rewatch them, 
And it's going to be a different experience each time because we have, have watched so many shows in between where we're going to be comparing and contrasting them. From Kingdom Come. But also understanding like, oh, this is a Japanese thing. Yeah, this is a cultural yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Or like, this is something that they do. So we bring that experience with us with every like rewatch yeah. that we do. And that's fun and interesting to take a look at too. Yeah. And so I hope that our viewers will get into enough anime where they feel that too, where they're like, oh, this reminds me of this and this reminds me of that. Yeah. And did they do it better? Did they not do it better? Did they do it justice? But they do they do it differently. And where did it come from initially kind of thing too? Like, what did they bring? Yeah. What did the studio bring? What did the studio or the creators bring to that genre? Like with Jujutsu Kaisen as a shonen, what did they bring to that genre? You know, and it, it's, it's meshed with horror. So it's like, oh, wow, is that something different? How did they do it? Uh, what makes it crazier or what makes it special, what makes it different. It's all of those questions that we're always asking. And I think that these shows kind of represent that. Very much so. Yeah. And like in the things that they're able to do with like the music and the animation and the stories. And I think that we're always going to keep watching anime, uh, watching shows for that very reason. Well said, Edwin. And yeah, for all we know. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And this has been a pleasure doing this episode. And yep. yeah, these are two giants. And yeah, they'll forever be a top 20, top 10. Who knows, yep. man? Our kill special. Yep, yep, for the kill special. We're going to be taking our first break. Coming up, we're going to have voice connections, manga recommends, wallet slayers, and finally, our general recommends. Stay tuned. And now we'll be doing a segment we like to call Connections, where we look at different voice actresses and studios that are connected to the shows that we've just discussed. Okay, and we're going to do simple today. I'll be uh, doing the Connections segment of it. And for my side of it, I have the two villains of our kill special. Our first villain, the more likable villain, as it were, Sasuke Kiruan. And her voice actress is Ryuka Yuzuki. Very interesting. Uh, she's also Shizuka in My Team Romantic Comedy. Just right. imagine that. Just yeah, that's unusual. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Edwin's a big fan of that one. And then uh, she's also Hilda Grey Rat from Ushiko Tensei. Oh, wow. She's the mom. Okay. How about them apples? I that's never really knew that. Cool. And also one other. Oh, wow, that is cool. Yeah. One studio trigger project we don't really mention that much. It's technically the first ever film. Uh, or at least the first ever feature debut film as a premiere. And she's also one of the characters there, another Studio Trigger production, uh, Beer Colossus. So oh, that's cool. the Japanese one. And then for the second half of the Kill Special with the villains, we got the insufferable but very unique <laughs> Azerith. Oh, uh, yeah. She's the Ice Queen to the T. She is phenomenal as a villain in the wrong and right reasons <laughs> and her uh, voices are very interesting akami at uh, kill i was listening more with the english side and english is excellent it's probably one of the best ones i've ever heard yeah it was really well done for the ensemble at least mm -hmm. and for the english actress is christine Otten. she also was sanji in one piece which is really cool she's also sakaki from azumaga daio and Martin's a big fan of that one. One of his favorites. Yeah. And finally, there's also a Fall Metal Alchemist connection. Once again, connection with Itsumi Curtis, the teacher from Fall Metal Alchemist, the same voice actress as the Lady Death in Azeroth. Oh, wow. <laughs> really cool. And that's one of Jamal's favorite characters, uh, Izumi. So shout out to our 950 Club members. <laughs> that's right. And now we'll be talking about manga that we've read this week. For mine, uh, 
I have a very interesting one. Not gonna lie, it's probably the most taboo one I've read in a while because I was lured with the art. And that uh, manga is called After the Rain. It's a drama. Uh, I'm not sure how many volumes is it. It's relatively older. It came out almost 10 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. But After the Rain, uh, it's about this girl. The main character's name is Akira Tachibana, and she's you know typical girl, tall and lengthy. And the main reason why I picked this up, too, because the initial cover, she reminds me a lot of Komi, design-wise, especially. Okay. And yes, similar to Komi. She's very soft-spoken, and she runs track and athletic like Komi as well. So th- this is an- another key indication, like, this could have been inspired by Komi can't communicate for sure. But anyway, she gets hurt from her track meet, and she needs to get money for her family. And she decides to work at a cafe. Something to do, you know, when you're hurt and you got nothing else to do, I would do the same thing too. And while working at the cafe, she kind of develops feelings for her manager. However, her manager is a little bit older. Let's just say a lot older. He's 45 years old. And somehow, someway, she just gets that perky interest with the man. That's a starting point, at least. And yes, this is a, it's a coming of age story. It's also a story where this is, we don't see this too often. And basically this is like a story where you have to question your, you have to question the character's morals and their growing pains rather than anything else. So there was two anime last season or the season before that kind of dealt with this topic. Yeah. Yeah. And they were, I, I liked, I enjoyed both of them. I mean, I, I thought they were very well done. I don't think that they played it out in a negative way. Not obscene either. No. Far from it. Yeah. yeah. Well, the ones that I think that we would read for the show or we would read on our own, yeah. they don't play it out that way because yeah. I'm not, that's not something that tempts me in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Uh, but the ones that I have seen have been handled very tastefully and very well. And it's it's like, it plays out in a, in a more, uh, I think it plays out more in a cuter, cuter or dramatic, more dramatic way. Yeah. Than kind of like, uh, uh, you know, like a person seeking any kind of perversion or, you know, like. Far from it. After I get rejected, I shaved and be- I took in a high school runaway. That's one of them. Yeah. And yeah, that was t- old, t- old, totally growing life experience type of story. The thing about I like really liked about that one where these were two characters who were essentially kind of lost. He was older in his career and he was chasing after older women who. Play him. Yeah, way. essentially yeah. they didn't because he had let himself go and he was just a salary man. And, and here comes this girl who has run away from home because she's having problems at home. And when he takes her home, he doesn't, there's no, he doesn't have any intentions toward her. And it's the first time where she feels like, oh, I have an actual home. Yeah. And so they kind of like save each other from the paths of destruction that yeah. they're on. So I thought that was really well done. And it's one of those things where you like, don't think too hard about it, but it's also like, wow, it's pretty ref- profound, at least for that genre too. It wasn't the story that I was expecting. I'm like, how are they going to play this out? And I was really happy and really pleased with the way that it played out because it was something a lot better than what I was expecting. Yeah, and yeah, the uh, the author is uh, Jun Mayuzuki. And, and have you read just the first volume? Uh, first volume, there's a second volume. I believe there's like a couple more, but it's big, big volume. And it was like one of those things where it also reminded me of Weathering With You. Like rain, oh, okay. is, rain is a very apparent theme with uh, these In characters. Both of these, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. And the author, uh, also did Iron Man and Cool Lun Generic Romance. So other other interesting w- works. And I'm showing Edwin the cover right now. And it l- doesn't it look like Comey? Yeah. Yeah. I, I can see yeah. it, yeah. It was like an initial reaction because I was looking for romances. It's been a while since I read one besides Comey or Kaguya-sama as well. And I'm like, yeah, let's we'll see what's out there. Oh, this one. Whoa. Kind of well, looks like Comey. For Maya Manga this week, it is Comey. It's Comey. Ah! It's Comey. Good, tra- good it's, transition. It's Comey Volume 18 uh, because I picked it up and I was like, I just want to read this. Uh, I hyped Ed, uh, I hyped Ed one too because let's just say I got a little quicker access. He got it uh, sooner than the release date, <laughs> which uh, I'm, wet, I'm I'm shaking my finger at him right now. Like, <laughs> don't do that, Jack. But I got I got I bought my copy and I was pleasantly surprised. And um, a lot of the things, they deal with a lot of the things, kind of the blowback from the cultural festival is still going on. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, that's like five, 14, 15 range. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot happened. Yeah. A lot happened at the cultural festival. A lot happened behind the scenes. 
And I'm glad that they're kind of, he's kind of like fleshing that out. The author's fleshing all that stuff out. But I also like the fact that Comey has this rival now and her friends are starting to realize this too. Oh, yeah. And so it's getting into more complicated territory. And it's it's time for Comey to, it ends on a cliffhanger. Yeah. And I was, oh man, that, that was like, no. And, and I was telling Edwin uh, that it's basically one of my top, favorites of the series number two my number one still is volume three and number 16 is really good that, yeah. really good so it's getting better guys just let I, me know i just have to say that if Dandaro, <sighs> <laughs> there's always i mean anime does this these shows do this will they won't they will they won't they will they end up together you don't know yeah yeah um Comey hasn't been that. Comey's been the cutest. Just about friendships overall. Yeah. And well, the, the main focus of Comey is is not really the romance. It's not will she end up with Dandoro or not. That hasn't been the main focus. The main focus has been her helping, you know, him helping her to make friends and have, like, the best high school experience that she can have. To be have. a communicator, yes. Yeah, to be, you know, to open up th- that world for her. And I, I think that the manga has successfully done that in the cutest way possible. Yeah. But at the same time, I've become invested in the fact of will they or won't they. And so now I'm like, Tandaro, you better do. <laughs> you, you better not. Don't don't prolong this, sir. Do not <laughs> prolong this. We're rooting for you, buddy. Yeah, so I'm rooting for both of them. So let's see what happens. Yeah. And that's my manga for the week. Well, you have another one too, don't you? Well, I did read another one of my favorites uh, dropped a new volume. Uh, it's uh, My Senpai is Annoying. Oh, they Their volume seven. Yeah, yeah. And they kind of had a similar thing going on where um, the characters had, one of the characters had said something and it was playing out like that. But it's more of the same. It's, it's very cute, very will they, won't they, uh, but done in such a cute way. And there's more development with the other characters, which I thought was really cute. Uh, so definitely pick that one up too. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then uh, for our uh, Wallet Slayers. Oh, boy. For my Wallet Slayer, Moshi Moshi B. I've been following this artist for a long time, and she's a very fascinating case study art-wise. Very apparent, very modern, but also artistic, in a sense of like, wait a second. Every time I see one of her works, it's so simple but so profound. And she has a contrast style. Three primary colors, usually red and usually black, usually white. And she bounces off of that. And wow, all these designs, all these great characters she does. We're talking about Zero Two. We're talking about Chun Li. We're talking about Haru from Sing Yesterday for me. Like, if anyone is doing any horror, I'm following them. <laughs> Full confession. Jack is there. Yeah. I have her as my wallpaper and it spurts with Patreon and things like that. It's been about time I mentioned her. So, hey, great, great job. For my wallet slayer this week, we have the tiger version of Taiga oh, Isaka. Oh, I saw that. Oh, man. That. It I is so adorably Aww. cute. Uh, instead of a bunny costume, they have her in a tiger costume. Oh. With the one piece bikini, the stockings, <laughs> the little tiger ears, um, the little tiger tail, yeah, the little bow tie. It's so cute. <laughs> so so cute. But it's also um almost three hundred dollars. Wow. Yeah. It's <sighs> it's almost three hundred dollars. Uh, there's no way I'm buying this <laughs> because it would uh kill my bank account, let alone yeah, it would slay my bank account. Uh. Not just my wallet, but you're talking into bank account territory. Uh, yeah, this is it's absolutely adorable. I would love to have something like this, but no, no, I can't. Yeah, uh, I know. You yeah. get, it, we just got our tax refunds. Hey, hey, no, man. Look, man. <laughs> okay, I still have bills to pay as an adult. Yep, so yep, yep. while I would love to add this to my collection, I'm still waiting for my pre orders. I ordered them last year. <sighs> Yeah, while I would love to add this to my collection, $300 is a, a bit much. Oh, I know. Yep. And now for our recommends. Yeah, and the, for our recommends, it's straight from the source again. Jack, the music guy. He oh, can't, yeah. He can't help himself. So with the music itself, with Kill Kill and Ak- Akami Got Kill, 
where to begin? These might be my two favorite scores, or at least in my top 10 range. Kill a Kill, usually up one or two, three or four, one or two, three or four. Oh my God, I can't decide because it's so gorgeous. The main composer is uh, Haruki Sawano. If you're familiar with that name, he also did Attack on Titan, the whole thing, the opening and closing, the scores in between. And yeah, from classical renditions to industrial, like zanius, traditional music, composition, Oh my God, he doesn't mess around. And he also helped out. I didn't know this. I thought he, I have to double check with my sources, but he also helped out with the 86. And the 86 was around that stretch too. And I think he did here and there other stuff too. And he also did Music for Kingdom, another epic series. And also Par Paramir, another studio trigger uh, reference as well. So like he used the first anime soundtrack official. Or you know what? It's the second one. The first one I bought was Ghost in the Shell, Stand Alone Complex. The first CD I ever bought, anime wise, Kill a Kill is my number two. And yeah, it makes me want to get all the albums now. <laughs> and then the music for uh, Akame Got Kill. Akame Got Kill uh, music is quite fascinating because you got the Skyreach song. Guess who sings that song, Edwin? Who? The voice actress for Akame. Oh, nice. Yeah, and that, that's uh, Sora um, Amai Mia. And the composer himself is Taku Iwazaki. He also did a, a lengthy career. We're talking about Ronoshin Kenshin. We're talking about Soul Eater. He also did a City Hunter movie. Oh, wow. Bad ass. And yeah, his music style, similar of uh, Sawano, like being very experimental in between stuff. But his style is a little bit more unique because during the transition scenes or the battle scenes where you build them up, he does these really weird, out of place tones, like the. I call the sitar, but it could be Middle Eastern instrument for all I know. It could be Japanese as well, where it's really stringy. It's like, like a biwa, similar to biwa, but it's a little bit more stringier, okay. and it's more it's more uh, lute like. Biwa's a little bit smaller, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And yeah, it's it's gorgeous music and really hypes you up and it throws you off a curveball. Oh, cool. Yeah, the music. Both of these shows are very important, and Kill a Kills. With the zany energy, even with its uh, ger- German overtones, it makes it great. <laughs> yeah, there's there, especially toward the end. There's a few songs in both of the shows actually. Uh, toward the end of the shows, where I was like really moved yeah. by the the scores and the the music that they were playing in, with the songs. Yeah, you know? in Iwazaki's case, like the the somber moments, like the yelling or the the wailing of the woman's voice. Oh, oh. Similar Gladiator, but yeah. even better, even better. I agree. Yeah. And for my recommends, there is a new book out called from Crunchyroll called Crunchyroll Essential Anime. Straight from the source. Straight from the source. Fan favorites, memorable masterpieces, and cult classics. It's essentially like our show, but in book form, <laughs> uh, because uh, Crunchyroll goes through the entire history of anime all the way back to the beginning. They start out with uh, Astro Boy. Oh wow! Back in the 1960s, and go all the way to Demon Slayer in the present, and it discusses, it names the shows, it talks the, about the importance of the show or the movie. And each one is different, and it talks about how it either changed the course of anime, how it influenced things, or how it made anime more popular around the world. Looking at the pictures right now, it looks like like the AFI Top 100. I'm seeing Cowboy Bebop. I'm oh, yeah. seeing Princess Mononaki right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, Pokemon. Pokemon is in here. Yep. So it talks about anime and how these shows were influential and are essential watching. And it's a great list. It's an amazing book. And it's it is pretty much covers the history of anime. And I think this is definitely uh, worth picking up and reading through. Yeah. It makes me think if they mentioned uh, Anime America, the podcast episode series. Or, it, it, I, I think this would be similar yeah. in a certain sense. But I think this goes more in depth than the show would be. Or at least with the content, yeah. Yeah. Whereas Anime America is more like how we transitioned or at least got the groundwork going with uh, anime. Yeah, anime here in the States. Yeah. But no, this is. This is all Japanese and how, um, I mean, even Sailor Moon is in here. Dragon Uh, Ball Z is in here. Uh, Akira is in here. Fist of the North Star. Fist of the North Star. Oh, yeah. That's one we... But then you have, you know, like... uh, That's one we have to mention more and more. That one's, like, ultimate... Like Metropolis, uh, Millennium Actress, uh, Death Note is in here. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know. Jack, don't knock it. Bash me. Give me all the hate. Naratu is in here. Sword of the Stranger. 
Uh, Redline. Redline's good. Redline's in here. Uh, so, I mean, there's Jojo, uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Which I have to get more into. Yeah, Attack on Titan is in here. Of course. Of so, course. yeah, it talks about all your um, Mob Psycho 100. Did they mention an Akamiya Good Kill? Did they mention uh, uh, Kill a Kill? Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. They Make get sure. mentioned. Kill a Kill gets mentioned in here. Uh, Akama got killed. Gets mentioned in here as they should. Um, well, it's it's they they'll do. So what they do? I mean, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood is in here. Good, good. So what they'll do is they'll list a show that's an essential anime, and then they'll reference other shows. And Akama got killed was referenced as one of the other shows that you need to watch. I'm yeah. stealing the copy as we speak. <laughs> I, I, I will I will let Jack use it uh, for a little while, but then I need it back. All right, guys, and that's uh, the end of our kill special. Thank you, thank you, yep. thank you, thank you. Thank you for joining in. Like, subscribe, share, uh, get the word out, guys. Uh, if you like the show, let us know. You know, send us comments. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, we appreciate you guys listening. And thank you for tuning in. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. We love you, and we hope to get more in soon. We're still steamrolling. We got a lot of great specials along the way. We keep working and planning. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. Thank you, guys. Bye.